Well, why don't we, why don't we proceed? Um, there will, there will, the minutes are public um, for people. If there is someone who's trying to uh, follow along with the meeting and requires closed captioning, please text us uh, and let us know. We're going to continue to try and get this to work throughout the course of the meeting, but I don't want to hold up the hearing. Um, I know that a number of people here are present here for, for this hearing. Um, so as I said, um, we're going to move directly into the public hearing first, but we will have roll call to determine whether we have quorums of both of the committees. And Laura, I would ask you to call the roll for uh, legislative matters, please. Sure. Um, Councillor Dwight. Here. Councillor Shara. Here. Councillor Mayori. Here. And Councillor Thorpe. Here. We all in attendance. Uh, George, you want yep, to go do? forward? Yeah. Okay. Um, for the planning board, Sam Taylor. Here. All right. Krista yeah. Granat. Here. Chris Tate. Here. And David Whitehill. Yes, here. Jana White. Here. Very good. And Marissa Elkins. Here. All right, that would be all of us then. Okay, all right, so we have two full bodies. So <clears throat> I would accept the motion by uh, any member of either body to open the public hearing. Move to open the hearing. Is there a second? Second. second. Okay, that was uh, the motion was made by Councilor Shara, seconded by Councilor Thorpe. Um, and Laura, you feel comfortable calling the roll of both bodies for to see sure. if uh, they approve to open? Okay. Um, okay. Um, Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Mayori. Yes. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. And then Planning Board Member Kohout. Yes. Planning Board Member or Member Elkins. Yes. Member Fowler, I didn't hear her on roll call. Is she present? No. No, no she's not. Okay. Member Granat. Yeah. Member Taylor. Sam, you're muted. I have two children under five, that's why I'm muted. Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. Member Tate. Yes. Member White. Yes. yes. And Member Whitehill. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, just help alphabetically, but I see how it can create some confusion. So, all right. Uh, that that is so. This hearing is open. This is a joint planning board uh, planning board legislative matters committee public hearing on proposed zoning changes. Um, there are two items before us. Um, we can. And it's probably given the way they're structured, it'd be just as appropriate to have them both discussed at the same time. Our process is normally that we invite proponents to speak to these issues and then opponents or people who are neutral or have questions can speak. The public is invited to speak. There is no limit on your time, but please keep to the items, not to other topics. Um, we're just, we're only allowed to speak to the items that are before us on this hearing. Um, the items are 21217, this is an ordinance to move a uh, zero lot line from section 10.14 to section 6.13. Um, this was referred uh, to community resources and the planning board and legislative matters, which is the meeting that we're having. The community resources has already convened their meeting. There was a neutral recommendation that came from them back on April 26. Also item 21.218, and that's an ordinance to amend zero lot line section of the code. <clears throat> that's also referred by the council on um, April 1st, 2021. Uh, it was referred to community resources, planning board and legislative matters. So it was again, another neutral recommendation from community resources and amended language was submitted by the Office of Planning and Sustainability. Uh, to address comments in the community resource meeting. And that was back in May 6, not all that long ago. Um, so first up, 
And as I said, we, we usually hear from proponents and we have Callum Mish here from the Office of Planning and Sustainability um, to lay out their case. Callum, you have the floor. Thank you, Councillor Dwight. Um, so we're um, here as part of the public hearing. This public hearing is required for any zoning amendment that's proposed. Um, I have a short presentation about some of the details of the proposed ordinances that are on the table. Um, and um, so I wanna, I'll go into that in um, just a few minutes. I'm gonna screen share here. Um, Oops, I just sort of, um, uh, Laura, since I made you host, it took away my co-host privileges, <laughs> so I can't screen share. Let me make you co-host. Yeah, thanks. Okay. okay now Gina Louise is host, so I think she'll have to do it. Okay, so I think I'm on. So, um, but since I made you host, you may be able to put on the closed caption now. I don't know if that's um, showing there. Um, so I was trying to figure that out to, uh, to see if that would help it. Um, so at any rate, um, I'm going to start this um, from the beginning. Um, so um, the first, um, this item or th this regulation that we call zero lot line um, really uh, means um, that, um, sorry, I'm having a problem with my computer here. Oops, went back. Um, sorry, For some reason. My computer is having a fit here. Okay, so I wanna go over the history a little bit um, how long we've had this provision, zero, what zero lot line means, or ZLL as it's shortened um, in the ordinance sometimes, is really um, an ordinance that allows a zero, a one side property line to be zero feet um, in um, a development. So if you own a piece of property and you wanna create another parcel next to your property um, and have um, either have the existing house be closer to the standard, um, to the property line than um, the standard setback um, or have a new structure on a new parcel, have a little bit more wiggle room to um, um, be closer to that, brand new side lot line that you're creating, that's what, or have your structures right on the lot line, that's what we refer to as zero lot line because you can go all the way down to zero feet and not have, um, you know, just have a zero setback on one side of the property um, that's internal to your property. So we've had this provision um, on, in the regulations for single family homes for about 20 years, um, a little bit more. It was initially created to address uh, or to allow different kinds of patterns of development um, in a cluster development um, uh, scenario where someone was creating a project that was a minimum of four or five acres and the way they wanted to divide the lot um, could be could vary depending on different features within the project um, or uh, just the way that it made sense to to align um, structures on the properties and um, well, shortly thereafter the city council adopted this flexible way of looking and developing single family house lots in urban residential B and urban residential C districts um, that were not part of a cluster open space. So that has, and initially when those were, that was created, it allowed frontage, the width of a property to be less than the standard width in those two districts, uh, B and C. And urban residential C is the residential district uh, that's essentially surrounds downtown Northampton. I have a map on one of the other slides that'll show where those districts are. And then urban residential B is the area sort of beyond that first ring and then going out to Florence Center and around Florence Center. So 
uh, when it was adopted as just um, to allow one or two or three lots to be created within neighborhoods in the urban residential C and B districts, um, primarily it was used as a tool for people to reduce the required frontage because it reduced the frontage by 10 feet at the time prior to 2012. And it also allowed setbacks to be reduced. But the way it was used was to allow the creation of a parcel with 65 feet of frontage instead of the standard 75 feet of frontage. And then it allowed the reduction of setback um, down to zero or zero, depending on how the applicant uh, wish to proceed. Um, and those were allowed, that scenario was allowed by right without planning board review, but there were specific design criteria that had to be met. And so what we're talking about um, tonight is tweaking that criteria that's been in place for 20 odd years. Um, in 2012, 2013, there were significant changes to, um, well, there was a reduction in frontage and um, setbacks in the URC district that um, brought the frontage requirements to 50 feet to better match neighborhoods in the URC and your um, B districts. And so um, that zero lot line um, provision was also adjusted down from 65 feet to 50 feet to match what's allowed, uh, what would be allowed for any kind of development in the B and C districts. Um, so I, there's an example here of, of projects that have been built to date. Um, this one here shows what I mean by creating this um, line, a division line down the center where the existing home is closer to the lot than the um, uh, standard 15 foot side setback. And then the new house that was constructed is, um, for this parcel that was under common ownership by this homeowner, created this lot line down the middle, and then the new house was created closer to this internal lot line as well. Um, so that's an example of how it was used um, to um, create that flexibility. Um, this uh, property on Emerson Way over on the far left side shows the way um, it has been used re very recently, but also initially was intended for the purposes of creating um, the flexibility for people to build and share a party wall, but still own the underlying land underneath the structure. So essentially this reads from the street like a two family or a duplex, but in, instead of sharing parcel um, lines um, or property, each owner of lot 15 and lot 16 actually owns the land underneath their structure. And then this um, center example is a way that it um, was used to sort of create a series or two parcels in a row. This was the parent parcel on the far left, um, two series, single family home, and the owner created two new lots um, out of this larger parcel and set one of the houses um, about four or five feet from the lot line. And then the second lot was gonna be um, five feet from this other internal lot line. So that's, these are examples primarily of how this has been used to date. The proposed change, and here's the map of the zoning districts, just so I can show you this dark orange is the urban residential C area surrounding downtown. And this um, slightly dark, lighter orange is urban residential B that expands from downtown Northampton up to Florence Center. Um, what's in front of you is a, is a, a modification of the text in order to address some of the concerns that have been raised more recently about the allowance for that flexibility to have two structures that are not on the lot line, but slightly separated from the lot line, that maybe there needed to be some standards to um, make sure that that gap is a little bit bigger and not create um, what has been termed as sort of an alley look um, between houses. Um, and also the other intent of this change is to introduce graphics to the text that have never been there before, 
ever since this was adopted, it's been um, kind of a difficult concept to both explain and also have people understand. So we felt like it would be important to have graphics to spell out exactly what's in the text. Um, and also what's transpired through this process is to um, think about creating a maximum uh, dimension for reducing that setback um, below what is the standard setback for these districts in B and C. Um, the other part of this ordinance is to, um, since this is all about dimensional layout, um, move this section into the chapter of zoning that is deals primarily with dimensional standards. So as I mentioned previously, the concept originally was adopted um, as part of an open space residential cluster, and then it um, sort of morphed into using the same design layouts for by right single family homes throughout the BNC district. Okay. Um, you know, I think some of the benefits are that this creates minimum um, setbacks. And um, in this case, we're talking about minimum setbacks, but also distances between structures, because that seemed to be one of the um, difficulties. Um, the downsides are that it does reduce some of that flexibility that property owners liked when they were creating um, or had the ability to create um, smaller lots carved off of their homes, um, house lots. Um, and, you know, there's been, since this went to community resources a couple of weeks ago, there was discussion back and forth about if there was an entire elimination of flexibility in um, citing new structures using this tool, that it would really, um, severely constrain what people could do with what a standard lot is now fit. I mean, a standard minimum lot size of 50 feet wide and how that limits the, the um, dimension that could be built um, on the parcels in the URB, a little bit in the URC, but the URC has a minimum setback of 10 feet to the side lot lines and then URB it's 15 feet. So if you think about a 50 foot wide lot, if you've got one setback that's 15 feet and the other setback that's 15 feet, that leaves 20 feet for a house width. And so in the upper corner is a house that's constrained by those 15 foot side setbacks. Um, and it's much narrower than a typical house um, in um, the neighborhoods. So, um, and, and it's harder to design for that, particularly in today's um, demands for families and sizing of rooms and hallways and trying to put all that together um, on a piece of property. Um, so, uh, but there are, you know, there's an, another example on the lower left of the use of um, a house built that gives a little bit more flexibility, but isn't quite on the zero lot line. So that's the um, end of my presentation. Um, and I'd be happy to answer questions and go into more details as everyone sees. Excuse me. So before you, we get to that, I, I wanted to point out, we have the, the city solicitor here. Um, there were some questions about the posting of this meeting um, before we went into it and whether it was done in the proper fashion, timely fashion. Point of fact, actually, there's a redundant posting for this meeting, um, one for the planning board and one for legislative matters. Legislative matters one, um, I'll spare you the long explanation, but the legislative matters one didn't have an updated uh, version of the proposal before us. Uh, Alan, would you care to share with us the attorney general's opinion relative to this issue? Uh, fortunately, um, uh, in this situation, uh, Carolyn posted the uh, hearing notice so at all times for the uh, statutory required period, there was a sufficient notice of this hearing posted on our website, which is the primary place for posting of meeting notices for the city. Uh, I've spoke with 
uh, a representative of the Open Government Division at the Attorney General's office, and I ran all of this by her today, and she was satisfied that we complied with the requirements and that we could proceed. Um, and thank you, Carolyn, for posting that. Uh, kind of saved the day or the evening. Uh, thank you. So, any questions? Uh, George, did you have a question? No, I was just thanking the attorney. Okay. Uh, does welcome. anyone have any questions relative to this? Or have we just sown more confusion than was necessary? Alan, I, oh, yeah, uh, Council Maori, you're muted. Yeah. You yeah, go. my question, yeah, my thank you. Uh, so my question to Carolyn was, so if you were talking about the downsides, is there any kind of um, permit process or um, way that a, a homeowner who wants the former flexibility around the zero lot land lot, lot line can apply for it, or you is it kind of just in stone? And, and pardon me, before you get to that, let's. I, I just I promised Alan if he showed up and gave that explanation. Unless anyone else had any of the questions for him or any felt any need for him to continue to stay, I would. He's got other meetings. He's got to dance around it. And so if, if no one has any objections, I think we can release him. Any objections or any questions? Alan, thank, thank you. you so much for your time. <laughs> thank Thanks, you. Alan. You're you're free to go. Uh, and I'm sorry, Councilor Miori and Carolyn, um, please proceed. Sure. So yes, the next um, step in the conversation is to actually talk about the uh, a newly revised um, set of paragraphs and language that was submitted, and this is coming off the heels of the community resources meeting, that there was discussion about uh, the elimination of this flexibility. So actually, the there's some changed, um, some offered changed um, text that would say, uh, basically still keep that flexibility, but set a minimum or um, um, amount of setback that the um, that can be reduced using this tool. So um, not so either you're at zero um, lot line, I can go through the sort of the um, four scenarios, which um, maybe I didn't even get to that piece. I cut myself off. Uh, Perhaps. Um, so, um, well, Carolyn, if, if you'd rather just present it later, that's fine too. Yeah. If it's in the. Uh, no, that, in the that's pipeline. fine. I'm going to go. Yeah, I'm going to go back to this um, slide. Um, so, hold on just a second um, so I can show you. And I should have gone through this. I think I uh, raced through it too quickly. Um, so, um, Okay, can you see that up now? So on the bottom tier shows sort of four scenarios in which um, this tool could be used to create a lot. And if you notice this, um, so the first two were in the original text are, are um, currently allowed and are also in this ordinance amendment that was moving forward um, where there are two if you're the um, owner of a zero lot line lot and you abut open space, that you could push your structure to the zero lot line provided that you have a five foot easement in the open space for maintenance of the structure. Now this wouldn't work with uh, previously approved um, public open space, but it could be used um, if you want to set your structure up against either private open space or as part of an overall development in which you're creating open space um, per that's permanently protected, you could develop it in this scenario. That's not changing. That's not being proposed to be changed from current conditions. The second scenario is a zero lot line. You're creating a new lot and you want to have two st structures abut. And so this dividing line down the middle is the side, new side setback and they're zero feet essentially, maybe a few inches depending on how the structure is designed, but for all intents and purposes, when you look at it, it looks like the structures are attached. Um, and then on either side of that, those two structures, you're meeting the standard minimum setback. Again, this is the scenario that's allowed currently, 
there's no proposal for it to change, just to have it sort of displayed in um, graphic form. This third box is um, a scenario that's allowed um, now, except not so specifically. Um, however, this is the scenario that was proposed to be eliminated in the version that went to count that was initially introduced to council. And this is the piece that um, I was referring to as if this wasn't here, um, this is what would eliminate the flexibility that exists today. But coming out of that community resources meeting, um, there was discussion about, well, maybe that flexibility is okay so long as there's at least, let's say, um, um, 10 to 20 feet, depending on the district, between the structures. So now we're not talking about setbacks so much as structures, but the way you get there is by allowing a little bit of a reduction in side setback. And in this case, in this proposed amendment to what was being introduced to council, um, this would allow up to a five foot of a reduced setback between the structures. So it does keep that flexibility to a certain degree, but doesn't keep all the flexibility that currently exists under today's ordinance. Okay. So yeah. in, the, in the URC district, what this would mean is the typical setback is, is 10 feet, but you could get a reduction of five feet between two lots. So in the end, your structures would be 10 feet apart instead of a standard 20 feet apart. In the URB district, where the side setback is typically 15 feet or the standard is 15 feet right now, you would have the ability to reduce that down to 10 feet, meaning you'd have 20 feet of distance between two new structures or an existing structure and a proposed new structure. And then the fourth scenario is what's allowed today but in, it's shown in graphic terms. The way it was initially introduced was um, to say, okay, here are the series of zero setback lots that you could create, but the last in the series, um, sorry, the last in the series, which would be this one, would have to have twice the setback between these two structures than normally is, a is required in a zoning district. So there was some discussion about, is that too much? Because then you get 30, feet of setback here when the standard setback in the district is only 15 feet. Um, and so there's been some discussion about that. The proposed language in front of planning board and legislative matters is to uh, amend what was introduced instead of requiring two times the setback just to have this as the normal setback um, of, of 15 feet in B and 10 feet in C. So that's certainly up for discussion. But so to the, the um, sorry, I didn't go through this when I was running through my slideshow, but so thank you, Council Mayori. <laughs> um, but that's where um, um, we're, that's what's in front of you today is sort of thinking about still allowing some of that flexibility. Thank and you. again, uh, still uh, by right. Yeah. Now, uh, I'm gonna have a little process uh, suggestion here. There are a lot of people in attendance to this hearing who will probably want to speak. And uh, what's going to make this work in Zoom is it to use the raise hand feature on your laptop, phone, or desktop. And if you're unable to do that, um, you can text us. Uh, Council Sherrick actually has this, I think, almost committed to memory what the, the various devices allow you to do. But um, yeah, and Carolyn, can we go back to the um, the Brady Bunch screen? Okay. The um, so if uh, folks want to speak, please use the raised hand feature, and then that will actually that'll put people in order so that I can address them because I can't see everybody. I can only see the first page of my screen. I see Bill. Bill Ryan's got his hand up so far. So okay. So uh, uh, Councillor Dwight. Yes. You're using the term text us, but I think you mean uh, use the chat. chat yes, thank you. Chat us, yes. Um, if you're having difficulty communicating with us, uh, use the chat feature if you have access to that. Um, so 
Right now, we've got Bill Ryan. So Bill Ryan, you are first up. And Ben Barnes wants to speak too. I see, I got you, Ben. <laughs> so you, you can go after Bill Ryan. Bill, you have the floor. Uh, you're, you're muted right now. Thank you very much, uh, city councilors and members of the planning board. Um, I just, uh, I uh, have a, I've sent you some testimony this afternoon with a little more detail, but I wanted to do just kind of a summary of my thoughts on this. Um, I was encouraged that this was being brought forth because I, I think it's a really important uh, conversation to be having and really appreciate the fact that it is happening. Um, I think uh, I think Laura has a, 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 a um, slide for me. If uh, you could put that up, Laura, and I could I just do. do my summary. Okay, one second. Currently, the, uh, the, the zero lot line uh, authorization in the zoning code kind of is teeter-tottering back and forth between the uh, uh, by right provisions in the URB and URC table of uses, where single family zero lot line is done by right. And, um, and then in the special permit category for all the standards. And uh, our experience in Bay State so far is we'd really love to see it pushed more towards the, the special permit where uh, a lot more public input is allowed and uh, public hearings are, are involved because right now we don't get that with any of the special permits because it's by right, the building commissioner makes all the decisions and there's no input or no opportunity for, for, for input, nor is there any power on his part to be able to uh, make sure that the neighborhood interests are being taken care of in any way. There's a should provision, doesn't fit provision, but nothing more powerful than that. So so, um, so I, I got interested in all these things that Carol was showing us and uh, decided that I wanted to apply them to a, a property and actually see what might happen under each of these uh, number of the different scenarios. So I don't know whether, uh, Laura, you can blow that up a little bit bigger so that uh, people can see it a little more or whether it's <laughs> There we go, that's great, thank you. And then, uh, so you could just slide it up just a little bit, I'll be able to see the top. Um, um, okay. I'm so demanding. I'm trying, there we go, that's better. So um, one of the first uh, properties that may come up for evaluation by this way is a property at 39 Landy Avenue in Bay State. Uh, it's a 185 foot, foot wide property on the street and on the right hand side, there is a stand of mature evergreen trees that have been there a long time and that the, that the uh, community really cares about. Uh, on the left hand side, there's a, it, due to lot shape as you, you might see um, over on the very left of each of these possible scenarios, there's about 10 feet that's not really able to be accounted for for setbacks. So it's effectively a 175 foot lot, at least under the assumptions that I'm, I'm making. And uh, I, so at first I looked at the standard setbacks and looked at what might be able to be built here. And so on this first scenario one, with the standard setbacks, you could have three lots 58 feet wide basically, which then with the standard setbacks would allow a house to be built about 28 feet wide. So you could have three houses 28 feet wide and there would not be provision for or, or addressing these trees on the side that, the branches from those trees extend into the property from the neighbor about 30 feet. So if the side setback's only 15 feet there, those trees are gonna be in trouble, at least from what I understand about trees. So, so what this would do would not really make anybody happy because I know uh, that uh, New Way Homes, who owns the property, likes to build 30 foot wide houses at least, uh, and often square houses. So 28, feet close, but maybe not as wide as they, they like, given their model. Um, plus the, uh, the, the loss of the trees, but there'd be a lot of, a fair amount of space between the houses, 30 feet between the houses. Uh, so you have th th almost 30 foot wide houses and 30 feet in between, which you all can imagine from what you know in your neighborhoods. So then I looked at actually both the scenario uh, of, um, of, what Carolyn was just showing us of uh, what was what I called two two I and two two double I, and uh, I didn't have room on this slide to put the results of both. So let me just go to the to the one there. This is the one. If you look, uh, you'll see that that 
the side setback is zero on the lot line to each of the side of the first two houses. And so when you move the side set or the house over, that gives you then all that 50 foot wide lot plus uh, minus the side setback on the other side. So you can build a house that's 35 foot wide. So in this particular case with, uh, uh, with that type of approach, you could have a house that is 35 foot wide, one that's 40 foot wide, and another one that's 40 foot wide, all with just 15 feet in between, which is not that different than the 10 foot alleyway construction that we've been looking at. Uh, it's a great advantage to a new way because the bigger house they can build, uh, he likes to build square houses, the more money he's gonna make off them. Uh, he's recently contracted a house on uh, Baker Hill Road that's about 45 feet wide, I think, uh, for $750,000. So th th there's a lot of money involved here. So then I looked at, and uh, by the way, the, the scenario 2i, the new one that's just been offered, uh, would end up with three houses 35 feet wide and space between about 20 feet. So a little bit better on the spacing, but uh, almost as wide a house as, and again, the loss of the important trees on the right-hand side. So then I, then I looked at, well, what could you do to solve some of these problems by in a special permit process? And um, uh, if you see that with the amount of room there, that you could make a lot on the left that's 50 feet wide, another that's 50 foot wide, actually put a side setback in of five feet on that 30 foot wide house that you could put there, which would also eliminate the need to have an easement on the uh, across on the other property, which is handy. And then you could have two, three 30 foot wide houses spaced in there. And then you could have uh, at least thir have 30 feet on that side setback for the preservation of important trees. So, um, so this to me is much more of a win, win, win situation uh, where the neighborhood would get consistent house sizes and between the houses. Uh, maybe the city involved in the negotiations could require houses to be fossil free. And then uh, New Way would get to build their 30 foot houses with no easements. So it seems like a kind of a, a way of solving a number of problems all simultaneously, but what could only happen through the special permit process because the things that are being uh, projected now or proposed now are all kind of across the board requirements. So this type of flexibility, I think, is really valuable, which is why I would like to see everything moved into the special permit category and allow this kind of uh, constructive, uh, thoughtful, creative um, decision making to be allowed, as opposed to as opposed to just things done by right and by uh, by across the board uh, requirements. Thank you. <clears throat> Councillor Dwight, you're muted. I'm sorry, my bad. I'm, I'm I'm telling Ben that he's unmuted. Ben Barnes, you're next. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> Hi. Good evening. I'm Benjamin Barnes. I live at 117 Riverside Drive, which is directly over the back fence of the three-house, soon-to-be four-house development on the corner of Warner and Federal. Um, I too support a special permit process with respect to Bay State Village for a couple of reasons. First, I'm actually in favor of increasing the density of residential units in this neighborhood closer to the center of the city. I support that policy. However, when you build, as we have seen on the corner of Federal and Warner, without regard to the scale of the houses on either side of you, you make a devastating, in my view, devastating, but certainly large impact on the texture and structure and scale of that part of the neighborhood. Now in Bay State Village, if you go around, there are some large multifamily homes. There are some row housing. There are some small, you know, turn of the century, two or three bedroom homes. And there's, you know, a whole mix. And um, I think that in order for the stakeholders for the community to have a say on this, which I think we ought to have a say, we after all create the ambiance of the community and, and a whole lot of tulips down there by the high school and the other things. Um, you need to have a, a process that has public comment. And the reason I favor a special permit process is that doing what um, New Way Homes is doing behind my house 
maybe if we had been not allowed to talk, to, had it been part of a public pr process, there might have been a modification in the architecture to bring it down to a more appropriate scale uh, for that portion of the neighborhood. Whereas if you go to other parts up closer to the uh, cutlery building, where you have larger lots and larger structures, then maybe you wouldn't need, you could do it, you do something different. So I'm just here to speak in favor of whatever can be done to create or expand the special permit process to give the neighborhood stakeholders an opportunity to speak and to be heard um, would be beneficial, not only to the neighborhood, but I actually think to the ultimate construction and design. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Uh, Jackie Balance, you're next up. Okay, Laura, can I have my first picture, please? For one second. Yeah. And thank you. I, I do want to thank Carolyn Mish for drawing public attention to section 1014, which is called zero lot line developments. Um, I'm speaking in regards to 221.217, which is about moving the ordinance to section six. I'm still waiting for my... Um, do you, you want them one at a time with the... Yes, yes, thank you very much, that's it. Um, this is the our ordinance as it stands without any revisions. It is brief and it is clear. If you look at the underlined words, they define a zero lot line development and these words are much the same as the revision. If you would like to read along in the original, I'll read the revision and you can see it's not changed much. The zero lot line side of a lot, not house, but a lot, must abut the lot line of a lot, which is under common ownership at the time the zero lot line development is proposed. So zero lot line development occurs by definition, whenever the same person owns the lots on both sides of a property line where a zero lot line house is sited. I can understand that it's simple. It does not require a uh, complicated explanation. Could I have my second picture, please? I want to show some site plans. The first corner uh, shows one of Carol's samples. There we go with the blues guys. If you could blow that up as big as you can, please. Uh, the first corner shows a sample development of three abutting lots and two zero lot line houses marked with red stars. And the fourth lot belongs to another owner. That's a sample that we've just seen. All the other red stars in this picture are zero lot line houses on just three corner lots in Bay State Village. They are all being developed right now, each lot with two or three new zero lot line houses that have oversized facades in relation to their lot size and they dwarf the surrounding neighborhood. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven stars. And there's one more house that doesn't have a star because it was the um, terminal lot of three in a row, which we also saw the example of, okay. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight homes are being built on three lots. Now, does this look like a typical pattern for building single family by right homes? Or does it look like a plague of many subdivisions? These are not typical single family homes being built by a landowner who wants to live there. These are all spec houses. Agents have been showing potential buyers the first two houses already built on Lower Warner Street as if they were model homes in a new suburban subdivision. If you see that a development is a different critter from your basic single family by right, then it makes sense that such a development would require, should require a special permit because so much is at stake for the resilience factor of the neighborhood that's impacted. Remember that this ordinance has been located in the code under special permits for 25 years. It was written for cluster developments, which is also under special permits. 
it seems like a very curious coincidence that the city is giving attention to this ordinance at this time when it obviously describes Hansel's newest new way building model. The question of needing a special permit is an important one. Why do we want to move the ordinance out of the special permits section and why now? Other questions just ask themselves. Is it not remotely possible that this could be seen by someone as a special favor to John Hansel? Does the move exempt him from future scrutiny under the ordinance of section 1014? Was it inevitable that someone would notice section 1014 and ask questions about it? I think it is in the city's interest to avoid even a whiff of a hint of an appearance of special favors in zoning or in any other legislation. That means that it is in the city's interest to keep ordinance 1014, zero lot line developments under special permits. Last picture, please, Laura, thank you. One more coincidence that I could not miss, whoops, there we go, was the use of a Hansel house as an illustration in the bottom left-hand corner of the slideshow. Seeing that picture just gave me chills. The question of whether or not to move the ordinance need not be confusing if we apply Occam's razor. If the ordinance means just what it says, and it was placed under special permits, because a development is definitely different from a simple single family by right situation, then the counselors need only add a few words to the ordinance as it stands. And I can give you those words, zero lot line developments require a special permit, period. Please vote to recommend leaving the ordinance in section 1014. Any changes to the language and details can wait until this question of placement in the code is settled. It is not unreasonable to ask that permits for Hansel's developments be suspended until the zoning implications are sorted. Please tell us who we can talk to about getting that done. Remember counselors that you are writing a law that affects people and families where they live. Please proceed with care. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Thank you. No, excuse me. Um, yes, Sam, go ahead. Before we continue, um, I, I guess I'd, I'd like to sort of speak to say that it, it's, we, we can all have opinions, but I'd like to make sure that moving forward, people not impugn other, the motives of the people who are working for the city. That's not okay. And uh, you can, we can, you can be against this proposal all day long, but it's, it's rude and it's not acceptable. Thank you, Sam. I, I concur. Um, let's see, next up, uh, Catherine uh, Komodar, and I'm sorry, I apologize if I mispronounced your name. You did very well, thank you. <laughs> um, I'm Catherine Komodar, I live in Bay State. The city says that these proposed zero lot line amendments came about in part to address the concerns of Bay State residents. I greatly appreciate that effort, and I thank you for the opportunity to have a discussion. In looking at these proposed amendments, however, I wonder if perhaps you have misunderstood our concerns for the amendments do not fundamentally alter the fact that the city seems to be giving away our neighborhood without our input while lining the pockets of commercial developers. Developments already using zero lot line, such as those at 170 Federal, 61 Warner and 291 Riverside will still be allowed, even if these amendments are passed there is not much difference between large luxury homes built 10 feet apart and large luxury homes built 15 apart, not really. New Way will still be allowed to buy a $260,000 Civil War era home as he did at 61 Warner and will tear it down after the demolition delay is over and build three large luxury homes crammed together in its place. 
this type of multi-house development will still be allowed and it will be allowed without meaningful public input or a public hearing. Who is steering the zero lot line development of Bay State? Is it the building commissioner? Even with these amendments, the building commissioner alone will be responsible for making the decisions about granting a building permit and will do so one house at a time. There is no forum to assess the impact of a multi-house development as a whole. We care about our neighborhood. We care about each other. We care about our earth. We care about our past, our present, and we really care about the future for our kids. We care a lot. And we wanna be a part of the process of deciding what kind of development is coming to our neighborhood. Mr. Hanzel is removing our affordable housing from the market making their yards into new house lots and building fossil fuel heavy luxury homes that are completely out of place and perpetuating a value system that seems to be comfortable with that. There are site specific situations in which zero lot land could be of benefit, such as siting two houses closer together to protect the significant trees such as Bill showed on his graph or in natural spaces bordering a property or even in which a resident homeowner is trying to add a second unit to their property for a family member or for rental income, and that this is the only way they would be allowed to do so and be able to afford to stay in their home. Zero lot line should be an exception to the normal zoning standards. And exceptions to normal zoning standards should not be given by right to anyone. There must be clear benefits to the neighborhood and to the city for such exceptions. All zero lot line exceptions to the normal zoning standards should go through the special permits process with its protections for neighborhoods and public involvement. We in Bayside have so many precious things to care for in our neighborhood. We'd like to care for it, not in the sense of locking it in the past. We don't want to lock ourselves in the past, but in the sense of stewarding what is valuable that we have here into the future. The future desperately needs much of what we have right here. We have a tree canopy. We have had until this recent rash of $670,000 houses, relatively some of the most affordable housing in the city of Northampton. We have a history here. We have a respect for our history here. And we have a community of people that by and large really wants to walk the walk with regards to affordability, equity, and environmental stewardship. The only way, only by requiring a special permit can the city evaluate whether or not, and I take this quote from the special permits um, section of the code, section C criteria that says, um, only requiring a special permit can the city evaluate whether or not the requested use will promote a harmonious relationship of structures and open spaces to the natural landscape, existing buildings and other community assets in the area. That is what I, as a resident of Bay State, would like. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, next up, I have iPad, which iPad, you're going to have to identify yourself for the public record, please. But you have the floor. <laughs> you're unmuted. You're able to speak. Oh, I'm unmuted. Sorry. I've never yes. done a Zoom before. Um, okay, I'm, so my name is Guy Constant, Constantine, and uh, I'm at 42 Warner Street in Florence. Um, like many of my neighbors who've already spoken, uh, I can see development looking out. Um, you're, we lost you. You're, uh, are you, you're using your phone. I presume no, actually using your iPad. Um, can you hear me? Can, um, if you can hear me, please try actually logging off and community. logging. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. We're, we're not, we lost a big chunk of what you just said. I'm sorry. I, I realize that this is difficult under the best of circumstances. And I appreciate that. There were some challenges, but um, if you have a reasonable signal, try again. All right. Am I am I clear now? So far, so good. Okay. I'll try to be more succinct and stop pacing around. <laughs> um, 
uh, when the counselor first uh, first in, introduced this uh, meeting, she was speaking about uh, today's demand for uh, design and that um, that the constricting that into small houses uh, was somehow a negative thing. Um, but we also have to consider that today's design is not just for today, it's for the lifetime of these buildings, which could be 100, 150 years. And to say that uh, large development, uh, large houses is what we should be doing in our city and allowing for larger uh, houses on smaller spaces is uh, what we're, you know, what we're for as a sustainable way to build in our communities. Uh, I, I don't think I'm in favor of that necessarily. Um, what I was saying earlier is that, you know, I'm just one person and I don't know the answers. Um, and I think that having community import is the only input is the only way that we could really answer uh, these specifics of zoning. Uh, in the sense that each situation is unique and each property is unique. Um, it, it, when we have these uh, zero setbacks uh, and allowing for propane tanks to be 10 feet apart on separate buildings, I mean, and in that space, it, it, it's a tiny space now, but what happens when a new owner comes in and builds, wants to build us in that space, and then it becomes even smaller and even more divided. Uh, I, I just don't, I don't think it's, 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 I don't know. I, I should probably stop before I wander on too long, but uh, thank you for, for considering my, my, uh, my voice. Oops, thank you for sharing your voice. I appreciate that. Uh, next up is Deborah Burke. Excuse me, Bill? Y yes, JT. I just want to bring to your attention, I'm not sure if you saw it, but there was an Ann Teschner from the Care Center who commented, commented in the chat that she wanted to talk. She came at the same time as Ben Barnes, just to let you know. Ah, oh, thank you. Uh, I appreciate that I didn't see that. I'm, I'm watching this on an iPad, which is just as limiting then so um so uh deborah if you'll bear with me Anne, are you there i am can you hear okay, me okay absolutely i can hear you there you go thank you very much and i apologize i didn't pick up your chat there no problem no problem um i just i find myself thinking um that sometimes we launch something and it's only after we launch it do we understand what we have done and what is not working. And um, I, I just, good evening, everyone. I live at 54 South Main Street in Florence. Um, and I think the zero um, lot line idea is just not working. Um, I mean, that can happen. We can launch something and it doesn't work, no problem. I, I do feel like it needs more public input. I think it's not doing what we want in our community. And I think uh, the, the whole idea of the special permit um, process is totally valid. Uh, thank you. Uh, Deborah Berkowitz, now you're up. <laughs> thank you. Um... My name is Deborah Berkowitz. I live at 41 Warner Street. I live on a very small block in which there have been six new houses built um, with zero lot lines, putting a tremendous burden on our infrastructure here. And I didn't prepare any words because I've just about given up hope. I've spent decades, you know, my partner and I volunteering for Northampton and particularly for preserving the architectural fabric of Bay State Village. Um, through our own work on houses, preserving houses, um, and volunteering with um, with the David Ruggles Center. And I just, my heart is, just feels really broken with what's happening here and with what I feel has been um, so much, so much, um, so much care and time from residents that seems to be falling on really deaf ears by our 
city officials and our elected officials. And my understanding of representation of government and of city officials is that they should be listening to and representing the voices of residents, you know, those of us who are here, those of us who are paying taxes. And I hear a lot about by right, you know, things have to stay by right. And I want to say that all over the country, buying and carrying automatic weapons, semi-automatic semi weapons is a right. And that doesn't make it a right. It doesn't make it right. Things, because they're a right, don't make them right. There's also a common good. And, you know, as a lesbian, um, there was a thing in the paper today about 25 years ago, looking back when the, um, when the photo exhibit of gay and lesbian families uh, was gonna be in the Amherst schools and a bunch of parents came forward and they, they didn't want it there and they didn't want their kids exposed to it. And, you know, there were laws that were around for a long time that, that weren't right. And we didn't say, well, they've been here for a long time, as we heard earlier in the presentation from Carolyn, you know, this, this has been an ordinance for 20 years, therefore we don't need to worry about it. Because what we know over time is that things change, we get more information, we have a better understanding, um, you know, of, of what's beneficial to society. And, and um, Catherine quoted the zoning code about, um, the harmonious relationship of structures. And Carolyn was quoted in 2013. And I think a lot of us, this is what we believed when we supported, supported the zoning ordinance changes that we were gonna get basic design standards that would maintain a consistent look throughout the neighborhood that would alleviate residents' concerns about past projects developed without such standards. Um, and that there were standards that would aim to have a project match the character of the neighborhood. And we did not get any of those protections that, were, that, were, that we were promised. And we're not going to get any protections here either. And what we have is we have large houses on small lots that are completely incongruent with the neighborhood. And I understand, you know, we have URB, but URB is a huge area. And being at, you know, on Main Street in Florence is very different than being in Bay State, where in fact, you know, that for us having a 75 feet of frontage is nothing. You know, our average lots are or half an acre or, or more. And so, you know, this is a very, very big change in this neighborhood. And I wanna say that for those, I do not believe anything that you're told about trees being protected by these zero lot line regulations, because I just watched three doors away from me, an enormous maple tree get killed because the developer, John Hensel, did not do, take any of the precautions that should have been taken to protect the roots. And, it, you know, it won't die this year, it'll die in a few years, but the roots were hacked off and the trees that are gonna be coming down on Liberty Street, the same thing is gonna happen. And, it, and those properties have zero lot lines. The houses are being built with zero lot lines. It does not protect the trees. What protects the trees is building smaller houses and taking care of the root structures. And um, I think that um, the, um, sorry, I'm, like really upset about this. I just feel like everybody needs to like come here and take a look and picture the, cor the corner of Warner and Hinckley with houses that are 35 feet tall. And Carolyn suggested, you know, that it might be more beneficial to have houses pressed up against each other, which would be on the corner of Federal, um, almost 4,000 square feet of houses when the abutting houses, one is 900 square feet and the other is 1,000 square feet. That's what's on either side of what would be in essence a 4,000 square foot structure. This is not consistent in our neighborhood. We were promised porches. And as far as I can see, you know, we're looking at a covered entryway. So even the design standards that the city put, nobody's coming to look at them or looking at the plans or enforce them. I don't really understand. So all to say that I would like to see this in special permits because I believe that, that as a community, you know, we're being told by the city that we have to worry about our climate emergency and think about resiliency. I'm wrapping up. Um, and building houses, you know, zero lot lines allow the, for the biggest houses possible. And it seems like if we're worried about the climate, if the city wants to have a sustainability and resiliency plan, we need to not be thinking about how to maximize every possible square footage of land to put houses on them, but we need to think about how we're going to have open space, how are we going to have trees, and how are we going to have more sustainable housing. And so I'm really requesting that this goes into special permits so that we have actually an opportunity to thoughtfully look at each project, what the impact is on the neighborhood, how consistent it is with what's around it, and what the benefit is to the, to the, to the community, to the, the climate emergency that we're in. Thank you.
And thank you. Um, next up is John Paul Matinsky. Good evening, everybody, and thanks for pronouncing my name correctly. Must much appreciation. Um, Crap shoot. Yeah, <laughs> it's been slaughtered many times. Um, my name is Jean-Paul Maitinsky. I live at 44 Liberty Street in Bay State. I'm a New York transplant, moved here uh, nine years ago. So I know something about living in high density housing. Um, there are advantages and disadvantages. I'm gonna keep my expression short and sweet. Uh, first of all, I do want to express appreciation to both the counselors here and the entire group of people here. This is an enormously complicated issue. And I realize that you're balancing many, many competing demands. Um, I also want to express that there are 53 people on this call. I'm sure many will not speak. It's very intimidating to speak at a forum like this as well-meaning as it is. So uh, don't take any silence as an expression uh, in one direction or the other. Um, here's what I'd really like to say though. We're at an inflection point. Uh, the issue is an enormously complicated and uh, many of my neighbors have expressed their sentiments as well as their rationale extremely clearly. Um, I wanna build on something Ann Teschner said. She mentioned pragmatic approach. Um, this country, our community is built on pragmatism. Um, pragmatism is indeed the process, the dual process of an idea being tested and modified. That's what pragmatism is. That is one of the unique characteristics of American culture. And um, it's a very rational, smart way to proceed with policy. Um, this is a pragmatic moment. There's no need to eliminate the special um, permitting process. It in fact is a pragmatic expression of what will provide a check and balance to each situation, taking into consideration the needs not only of, uh, of builders or the city or provisions, but also of each community and each circumstance. So I simply want to say, go with the pragmatic approach, the test, revise, test, revise. That's the best way to do things. It's what the scientific method is built upon. Um, and I simply, I simply urge you to keep the special permitting process in place, at least for the time being until this has uh, resolved in an even more coherent way. Um, it, is, it is in all of our interest and uh, your role as stewards of the city, um, which I recognize you're balancing in many different ways, but it is your role as stewards of these communities, this environment and the city. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, and Rue Walther, you're up next. All right. So I don't have any type of uh, pictures to show. I have my front yard to show. I'm on my steps. That is the regard of a zero lot line. As I walk, this is how far I walk. This is the edge of my yard, this is the driveway. That is the house. So if you haven't seen this and you look at Carolyn's picture, the picture showed not this house, but the one 10 feet away from it. Let me show you that. The house that was 10 feet away is the only one she showed in that picture, along with the charming yellow house. It may look right in my picture that's right there. That was a house that Cindy and Mike lived in for their lifetime with their children. This was one lot. Cindy would always tell me, it's a buildable lot. And I always expected one day there would be one house on this lot. God, this is, let me see if I can get my camera in here. This is, well, that's the garage. This is a house. There's the propane. And that's the distance between both houses. I guess if you measure between those propane tanks, there's definitely not 10, 10 feet. This is a garage. I'm not sure what Hansel's planning on doing with this. I'm imagining he's 
doing something because over here is the driveway and the driveway is for three houses, three houses on Cindy and Mike's old driveway. There's Cindy and Mike's house next door to it. It didn't look so bad in Carolyn's picture. Carolyn showed just the house that's right here on the corner and a little cute little piece of Cindy and Mike's house. What you didn't see was the two houses next to each other. And what you didn't see was right there is the gentleman that spoke earlier, the other abutter, his house. I don't know if you can see this big crane right here, but this is going to be the site House. There's the crane. Rue, your, your camera's freezing up. Rue? Yeah. That I'm is sorry, my we... presentation. My presentation is for you to see exactly and what 10 feet looks apart and what it looks like. When I used to look out and sit on my front steps, yes, I had a yard. Like I said, I knew there could be a house. I also saw a tree. Now I see nothing. It won't change for me. It won't change for me. But if there had been a special permit involved in this, I would have been there. I didn't know until there were like three houses cordoned off. Don't let special permits go away. If we let special permits go away, if we don't stand and fight for this, then we might as well just turn our neighborhoods over to developers, let them take down all the rest of the houses and say, have fun, we are now a subdivision. Thank you. Oh, so I am obviously for permit for special permits. <laughs> I got it. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Hang on a sec. Uh, Holly, Holly, if you could give us your last name, please. Mute. Start video. Hi, my name is Holly Quigley, and um, I live at one thirty nine Riverside Drive. Again, I just wanted to support. Um, support, again, the zero lot and the special permits and support what the other people, Bill Ryan, et cetera, um, Benjamin were saying. And that's pretty much, I just wanted to say, that's what I wanted to do is support it and thank the counselors for not having any preconceived um, opinions prior to this and are not knowing how they're gonna vote prior to this and listening to everybody. I really appreciate it. And that's it, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next up, Reyes Lozaro, please. Thank you very much. I'll be brief. Um, thank you to councillors for the tremendous difficult job you are doing. A big shout out to my neighbor from Bay State. You are larger than life. You are demonstrating what grassroots democracy is. Good for you. Um, I only, all I want to say is what they are saying makes sense. It makes sense. It makes sense. And please, councillors, think five years from now, imagine a Bay State that has been developed according to the, to what Ru has showed us or to the maps. Think on what side you would like to say you were. Think what you would like to tell a kid you had supported. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Doug Russo, you're up. Okay, I'm here. Uh, yeah, I, th I really like Rue Walther's presentation because I'm wondering how many of the city councilors and, and members of the zoning board have actually come out and seen the two houses that are uh, at the corner of Federal and Warner. Um, it's one thing to look at blue dots on a, on a map and make these decisions on setbacks and lot lines and whatnot. But until you actually go out and see the consequences of those uh, uh, zoning decisions, I don't think you understand what's going on here. Um, because if you, if, you could if you carry on with what's, what's, with this, what's happening in Bay State, you're gonna end up with basically like um, Jackie Balan said, a, a subdivision because you're gonna have more and more houses built by the same builder, and he builds, you know, pretty much the same looking, same style house each time. I'm not noticing a much difference in his architecture. Um, so, how many houses? How many new houses are we allowed to have before we change the character of the neighborhood and bring in, basically, make a new subdivision where we didn't have a subdivision? Um, one more thing: 
if you do constrict the size of the lots, you're just encouraging builders to build higher. And when you build higher, you're gonna end up uh, annoying neighbors who now have their sight lines impeded like roof, for instance, or just you're gonna cut out the sun that they enjoyed for many, many years and no longer their garden is all gonna get the sun that it had before. And you're, you're really changing up a lot of the basic environment of the neighborhood by building up higher and higher. So uh, what, I guess, I guess, um, uh, well, I guess that's all I have to say. It's just that, uh, I, you know, I've been in this neighborhood now since 1992. And, um, you know, it's this, the changes that are occurring now are rather, rather quick and rather dramatic. I'm not against changes. changes change happens all the time. But I, again, I don't think the city councilors are really aware of the what's going on in this neighborhood, unless they've actually done a real tour uh, and seeing what's going on here. And you can imagine what's going to happen now up at the corner of Hinkley and Warner and what's going to happen at the corner up at Riverside and other, other lots in the neighborhood that have been purchased and houses are sometimes torn down or just other houses built next to them. And perhaps then you would re you know, reconsider and uh, and, and, can, and require special permitting to try to stem what's, what's, what seems to be an inexorable tide towards suburban style houses that are really out of character with the established neighborhood in Bay State. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Darcy, if you could identify yourself by your last name as well, please. Sorry, I had to unmute myself. Um, my name is Darcy Sweeney. I live at 31 Lexington Avenue in Florence, and I want to support the idea of the special permit permitting process. I'm especially distressed that the Department of Building and Sustainability isn't, is allowing building that is so unsustainable. First of all, allowing knocking down houses, which I guess is going to happen at 61 Warner Street, is is just obscene when the city is talking about being net carbon neutral by 2050. The greenest house is the house left standing and John Hans Hansel is not building green houses in any way, shape or form. He built a house next to mine. It's tall, it's voluminous. It's like a 1980s style house, probably tall ceilings. Uh, the, the roof wasn't sited for solar, even though there's unobstructed southern exposure. And I actually went over and asked him why he, was, he had built it that way. I was away when the house was built and he just shrugged his shoulders. Clearly not at all concerned about um, renewable energy and the big propane tanks that he puts typically beside his house tells it all. This is a house going into the future that is fossil fuel dependent. He doesn't care about the new owner being able to install solar panels in a way that will make them really efficient and effective. So I, I that uh, the, the neighborhood is many people and concerned about it, then, see, then the, the Department of Building and Sustainability that are sort of, I don't know, at least not putting the brakes on this kind of development. It, it is really shocking and discouraging. So again, I think it's essential that the neighborhood be given the chance to weigh in on, on these and put the brakes on this kind of development. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Jarrett. Thank you. Thank you to everyone who's spoken. Alex Jarrett, uh, 8 High Street in Florence and the counselor for Ward 5. Um, I'm really glad we're taking a hard look at Zero Lot Line and, and how it is playing out in particular. Uh, so, you know, Zero Lot Line allows for wider and which possibly larger uh, single family house sizes. Without Zero Lot Line, the larger houses could be built only with larger lot sizes, uh, which would result in fewer of them, or we would have smaller houses. Um, we could also, as uh, Doug <coughs> talked about, have taller houses or uh, longer houses. Um, and so otherwise, if, if someone wanted to have a development like this, it would have to be structured as a condo association, uh, in which case they could be put quite close together but they would have to go for site plan review or a special permit depending on the size and the number of units. 
So one concern is, are we creating an end run around these regulations? If you can avoid the significant tree ordinance, uh, fossil fuel requirements, uh, et cetera, that would be required if it was a multifamily, such as a condo association. Um, the zero lot line also allows for flexibility, which can preserve trees or accommodate different site features, but if that's a priority for the developer. So um, I do believe, so my understanding is special permits are not now required for zero lot line for, for this use. Uh, I spoke with the city solicitor and, and while it is confusing to have this in the special permit section, because it is referred to as by right in the URB and URC zoning, that's what controls. So um, it doesn't currently require that. My concern with requiring a special permit for zero lot line and thus a more difficult process would probably mean that developers would find every way to avoid it. Uh, in Bill Ryan's example, the three 28 foot wide houses would be the most likely uh, with no consideration for the trees. And uh, as referred to uh, also on other lots, you know, that they could just build higher or longer. So on the one hand, we don't wanna create an onerous requirement for someone who's looking to split off a lot. Um, <clears throat> but on the other, we are seeing this used in a way that is maximizing the house size on the smallest lot uh, with little consideration for the neighborhood or, or for trees. So it's a, it's a balance um, that is tricky and you all have, uh, and I do, uh, when it comes to me, um, a lot to consider in, in thinking about this. Um, and so I would suggest that we consider limiting the role of zero lot line to the, the townhouse style development or a small reduction of setbacks, um, such as the five foot reduction in the standard setback. Uh, this would, you know, in the URB district, not allow the 10 or 15 foot distances between the houses that, that create that alleyway effect, but would allow houses to be 20 feet apart, which is commonly found in historic development in the district. Um, and should we provide a mechanism for going beyond that uh, for such as a special, special permit status? It, it's certainly worth considering. Um, so those are some thoughts I have, and I just am, I, I don't have my mind made up about how we should go, and I look forward to continuing to, to hear the discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Anne has texted me, uh, Anne, you cannot, this is a public hearing and has to be conducted in public. So you can't use the chat feature to speak with everyone off camera that's not being recorded. I hope you understand. Uh, if you do wanna speak again, I, I'm prepared to recognize you. Um, and we have, now hang on a second, Jackie, you're up, but let me just make sure there's no one else who hasn't had an opportunity to speak, who wants to speak before you, because you've had one bite of the apple already. Sandra Mendel, you may speak, please. Oh, you're muted though. Yes, thank you, you very much. Um, I, could, I couldn't find the hand thing in the, uh, in the toolbar, so thank it's, you. It's okay, we gotcha. I had, um, I had a statement written out about predatory development that is how I experience what's going on in my neighborhood, Bay State. I live on Liberty Street in Bay State. Um, and rather that I'm, I'm really proud also of a lot of, a lot of the presentations today of my neighbors. And what I wanna do is, is ask that all the um, administrators and counselors, the elected officials to please take into consideration doing whatever you can to stop this type of predatory development in this community. There are many, many new houses in our area that have been built on small lots that you walk by them and your reaction isn't horror. It isn't heartbreak. It's not, it, they're just, oh, a nice new house that uh, it, it's, it's certainly nothing that you would consider uh, a luxury, house that's being developed. So I, I, if what we're talking about today is supporting the special permit, I'm in strong support of a special permit and anything that would help uh, have development of houses in our community be in accordance with everything that we discussed in 2013, which all has been covered by other speakers. Um, 
what's currently going up it literally it feels it feels like gentrification in that it's to appeal to a very different class of people who have a lot of money to be able to move into this type of community and it, it really is heartbreaking what's going on and if you haven't been here come on over please take a walk don't just come see the houses take a walk and see what the, what exists in bay state and why it's worth preserving thank you very much thank you um jackie thank you i just i just want to say how sorry i am that sam thought i was questioning anybody's motives um i didn't I only asked what I thought were the obvious questions. Why move the ordinance out of special permits? Why now? And isn't it a coincidence that it, the ordinance seems to match what John Hansel is doing? I asked those questions. I did not question anybody's motives and I'm sorry it might've seemed that way. I've apologized. Noted. Councilor. Uh, yes, I, I I saw Joyce Rosenfeld um, raise her hand. Okay, Joyce, Joyce, yes, yeah, and you're not the only person to note that, so thank you, uh, Joyce. Would you like to speak? Thank, you, thank you, thank you, Rachel, and thank you, everyone. Thank you to my neighbors who have put, oh my goodness, their life's blood into this research and um, these presentations. I uh, live at 15 Warner Street. I'm uh, across the street uh, from the Hansel development at uh, Warner and Federal. I live next door to Reyes, who is also across the street from the development. And I live across the street from Rue and her dear house that is almost the size of the garage um, that has been put up. Uh, surely, if we had had any kind of input, if we had been able to see the plans, um, we would have used our energies and our resources to come to some compromise with what has uh, been put up with vinyl siding, propane tanks, and which looks like um, uh, a 1980s wallpaper um, of what a suburban development would be. Um, it is heartbreaking. And um, what used to be um, a beautiful view, what used to show me sky out of my downstairs windows um, is now filled with um, houses that uh, I believe should have come under special permit and that there should have been input from the neighbors who care so much about our neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you to the council. Thank you. And it should be noted, it's both the council and the planning board. We don't, it's not just us here today. Um, anyone else wish to speak? Um, let me flip through the pages here to see if anyone's actually raising their hand or anything. Okay. Uh, Carolyn, I, now you actually has been kind of a laundry list that's been given. I don't know if you want to respond to at least uh, many of the comments or remarks that have been made. Um, sure. And yeah, go for it. Um. I'm not really going to take these in any particular order, but I want to um, first differentiate between what's allowed to be regulated under zoning and what is in the building code or the stretch energy code, and that does not have anything to do with zoning. Um, and those are things like utility connections, um, propane tanks, which are a substitute for natural gas, which otherwise would be piped in because natural grass, gas is in the street. So because of the moratorium, there's um, uh, propane tanks are um, used for various utilities, as you probably know, um, but that's regulated by the building code, the plumbing code. Um, there's nothing that the city can say to dictate 
what kind of utility a single family home um, incorporates um, as um, part of their connections. Um, the same with the way a house is sited, just like anybody can opt to change the siding on their house from one material to another. That's a material change that's regulated by the building code. Um, so uh, even if there were special permits for every kind of development that you could think of, the planning board wouldn't have no jurisdiction about the type of um, siding used unless there were some other design standards that were based on a particular, you know, historic character of a neighborhood that is in a very defined geographic area. Um, the one thing that, um, so there, there are many other things about design or, or elements of the building that, um, and new homes all have to meet this energy, uh, stretch energy code. So they are much more um, energy efficient than, than older structures to, to begin with. Um, however, you know, you can obviously get into details about um, 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 carbon and embedded carbon with um, existing homes versus teardowns and that kind of thing. Um, but I do, you know, what it sounds like people are concerned about are the total number of lots all at once being built as opposed necessarily to the use of this tool to allow flexibility. Um, uh, under state statute, if you meet the frontage requirements, the board is required necessarily to create, to allow the division of lots for single family homes. So anyone at any time can carve up along a street um, lots by right. And this isn't unique that's happening in Bay State. There have been pockets of, you know, four and five lot divisions that happen through A&R throughout the city. Um, you know, I, there may be a path in which the city council could consider um, the development of new lots, you know, that abut each other. If you meet a certain threshold, then that automatically triggers special permit or site plan. Um, that that would be for a different day, another discussion, another introduction. Um, because if that's the concern about the total number of lots that abut um, that need to have some different kind of analysis or review, um, there may be a legal mechanism to do that. Um, although I haven't done enough research to know for sure, because there is that statutory allowance for um, coming to the planning board to create a lot if you have enough frontage. Um, and um, the reason why, and, and you certainly can't take any of the items today that are by right and make a recommendation to city council to uh, make this provision special permit. That would be another, that would be a completely separate ordinance that would have to be introduced. Um, and so you can certainly modify what's in front of you, but not um, create a whole nother animal that hasn't been part of this advertising or part of this concept. Um, the reason why this is, um, these are single family homes that are allowed by right and not by special permit is because of the rules that are established to create these set of conditions and this flexibility. So it's not only about the lot layout, but it's about adding trees to the lot when you're all said and done. So each of these zero lot lines um, currently and as proposed moving forward with no changes would um, be required to have, um, you know, four shade trees as part of the, um, uh, part of the end of the development. So each lot has to have four trees uh, planted. Um, it is um, also the case that um, unless there's some other site plan that's triggered for say a shared driveway to access some of these lots that um, the significant or the tree replacement criteria would not be, um, uh, would not be triggered. So um, there wouldn't necessarily be a requirement to replace a certain number of trees on a property um, unless there were some other site plan or review by the planning board that would trigger that. Um, 
just as anyone who builds a one-off single family house lot can go in and cut down a tree without um, replacing um, trees in accordance with the calculation. I will also remind um, people in the public that even if the tree um, review and replacement criteria are triggered, it doesn't mean that the trees can't be cut down. It just means that you're obligated as an applicant to replant new trees according to a specific formula that's already codified in the zoning. Um, so the example that um, Mr. Ryan proposed for uh, Landy saying that those trees um, would be saved because a special permit would be required or site plan would be required isn't necessarily the case. Um, an applicant can opt to cut trees down. They would just have to replace those. Um, and um, I just, the other, only other piece is the zero lot line ordinance isn't about trying to minimize the width or, or create design about how wide a house is just like in today's um, standards and all the other um, development projects, there's never been a set um, determination about how wide or narrow or long a house can be. There's always been that flexibility. Um, and we haven't incorporated that kind of design. Um, so I don't know if there are other elements that you want me to respond to, but I'd be happy to. Um, right now, we're still in the context of the public hearing. Let me explain how this is, works. That this is the opportunity where the public gets to speak and share their thoughts or ask questions. Um, when we close a public hearing, then it will be up to the deliberators to speak at that point. The public will not be able to participate unless a member asks for them to be recognized, in which case then the, um, then the two bodies would vote to determine whether that's, they would allow that. So um, what I'm saying in short is speak now or forever hold your peace, at least in the context of this conversation. Um, if you have new items to share or questions that you want to ask or respond in some way to uh, what Carolyn Mish has just said, um, use the raise hand feature or, or as in Joyce's case, who's next to be able to speak next, wave your hand. And if you can't do that, um, text me in the chat and um, other people will watch out and we'll, we'll try and get you recognized. But right now, Joyce, you're up. You're, oh, there you go. I, I appreciate um, uh, that Carolyn uh, addressed various issues, but I still don't feel that, um, that I or my neighbors have been heard. Um, and I don't hear that our concerns uh, are being addressed. I hear that the letter of the law is being um, told to us and how it has been um, is how it is and how perhaps it will always be. So that is a concern of mine, um, you know, as a neighbor, um, I, I don't feel that our concerns that have been expressed uh, are being heard. Thank you. You're welcome. If I am, I'll, I'll take advantage of my position here and at least try to come up with a response to some degree. Uh, zoning by and large is not a precision instrument. It is a blunt instrument and it actually um, applies uh, over a large expanse as we've described. You know, North Main Street is different than Bay State and Florence and, and so on and so forth. But the fact is, is that you create the zoning in order to um, manage how those areas develop, but you can't completely control. You're limited by what you can do under state law and, um, and privacy ownership laws and the like. I want to say, and I've heard this alluded to by others, that hearing, we've heard you and we felt and we actually, and, and I, I won't speak for everyone, but I'm, I'm pretty sure we share the emotions that are invested here. 
and the concerns. There are limitations as to what we can do because um, for a reaction, there's an equal reaction and the, and the responses usually proves unsatisfactory to somebody somewhere at some point. The part of the thing is, is that what we're discussing here does not provide you with the answers that you are seeking, with the concerns that you are talking about. What we're addressing here is actually just a, a portion of the law. So to the extent that you're asking for uh, it to remain in, in special permit, that is something that is appropriate for us to discuss. The rest of the issues, we really don't have any control. We can't stop uh, what's already allowed by right now. Um, you can't, we can't do what's called in effect spot zone either, or what has been sort of, well, in the, <laughs> which has been implied is that uh, creating a favorable condition for one particular developer that is also against the law and that uh, I would like to assure everyone that is not the case. Um, but the fact is, is that the concerns that I've heard and the, and the distress that I've picked up on, while we hear it, we can't fix it now. We don't, that's not before us to fix that now. One of the concerns though is to not facilitate, at least that's why I hear from Bill Ryan and among others is don't create an opportunity for it to uh, get worse, say. And that's the conversation I think that we're gonna be having to, to before we render our decisions. So, but please understand and know that, uh, and this is not the first meeting, we've had multiple joint hearings at this point and they've heard particularly from this neighborhood about this particular developer over and over again. But also remember that we're making zoning for the entire city as well. Um, let's see. We've got, uh, well, uh, Deborah, you've already spoken and I will let you speak again, as have you, Jackie. So both of you'll have to wait. Uh, John Hansel would like to speak. Uh, Mr. Hansel, you're up. And you're muted right now. You're muted, so I can't hear you. There you go. You're all set. Okay. I'm afraid to speak because I do have a lot of people that don't have very, not much good to say about me. I don't think I'm an opportunist. A lot of opportunity did come my way and I took advantage of it. It just happened to be by chance that these properties came available to me all at one time. But people keep talking about these houses. Nobody's talking about the people that I'm bringing into these neighborhoods that wouldn't have an opportunity to live here. And I gotta tell you, I've had nothing but the best buyers, some of the best people, some of the best people you can talk about for buyers. People buying Warner Street. One person bought it. She was, she was born in Florence, raised in Florence, coming back because her children live here and her grandchildren. She wants to be here with her children. I guess that's a problem for some people. Another person, I mean, the other buyers that I've had up in Northampton have been nothing but the best. And nobody's talking about the people who are moving into these houses. It's all about, I don't want it in my backyard. I don't want development. Change happens. And if you, you put three people in a room and talk about design, everybody's gonna have a different attitude, a different opinion of what's gonna look right. And I really wanna to apologize to the planning board and to the city council for what I brought it on them. And I just think a lot of this is just pure, I don't want something in my backyard. Yeah, like I said, uh, no, the things they say about me aren't true. I try to build a good house, a decent house. And you talk to my buyers. You know, that's what no one's talked to. No one's talked to the people who bought my houses, purchased my houses. It's just the people that, some of my buyers are afraid to say anything. And it's just gang mentality. And I just think it's, it's wrong. And I don't know. I really don't know what to say about it. And some of the things that have been said, some of the hypocrisy that's going on with people who condemn me for buying a house and saying that I'm buying it at an affordable price and somebody else could buy it and fix it up with sweat equity. There's one person right on the street did the same thing. I'm not gonna name names. I'm not gonna go to that. 
But how many times I hear my name trash tonight, spoke negatively of, I try to build a good product for good people that want to buy them. And when Bill Ryan said, I build a house for 750 on Baker Hill Road, when's the last time you bought a two by four for $10? You don't know what it's like out there. You don't know what the costs are right now. And if anybody can, you know, I don't know. I just, if anyone has questions for me, I'll answer them. But right now, I'm just going to just stop what I got to say. Thank you. Thank you. And um, just remind folks, uh, actually, everyone's been speaking here has been fairly emotional. And uh, I want to point out that what we're talking about is a dimension, uh, is a change and a move in the code book, and then a wow. modification to the code as it stands. Um, that's what this hearing is about. Now, I understand that um, this is inspired by real life experience and conflict and that emotions uh, <laughs> are guaranteed to run high. And Mr. Hensel, if you could put yourself on mute, I'd appreciate that. And, uh, thank you. Um, so as we go forward, when we have these conversations, I th it is not in the interest of this hearing or the discussion or for the edification of, uh, of the deliberators to have an emotional back and forth between any number of people about any number of things. If we could speak to, if we could stay on point and about the particular issue rather than having a debate between each other, because there's opportunity for that, but this is not that forum. So I've got four hands up. Deborah, you're next. Jackie, you're next. Actually, if, if you would all defer to Andrea or Andrea, uh, who has not had a chance to speak yet, I would, uh, I'd appreciate if you let him speak. I'm just going microphone and then video. Yeah. yeah. All right. You're... Yeah. Hello. Actually, it's, it's Mike Zink. Uh, my wife and I are both together on the call. So that's why. Um, it's under her name, Mike Singh, 32, Li 32 Liberty Street. Mm -hmm. Just for the record, some of the camera. There we are. Okay, I'm sorry <laughs> about this. So a um, couple of things uh, I would like to say. First of all, I think um, Mr. Hansel was just very personal and now you're telling us we should um, keep our emotions low. And I ask for a little bit of fairness here um, because I think um, then I would think that he also treats us fairly because we are people in the neighborhood and we have concerns and we think we have to address them. And I hope I'm allowed to speak in that sense because I was just told that he outbid someone at the house that's on the property of Liberty Street and Riverside Drive. And I don't know how, how nice and how well is that when a family wants to move in into a property and gets outbid by a developer. Sure, it's your right, but I think you're portraying yourself a little bit, not to the facts I see here, to be very honest. The other thing I also want to see is say is um, that I would like to know from either committee here who is responsible for, no, who's, who's uh, at the table and all the counselors today, who uh, can tell me and give me some advice about the propane tanks. Because when I saw that picture that just Ruth, the Ruth showed earlier, I got really concerned when I see two propane tanks from two different houses being so close together. That makes me really, really worried. I wonder how someone can agree, Ru, and I see you, to that not being a fire hazard, right? Um, I just, I'm not blaming anyone here, please don't get me wrong. I just wanna know who I can talk to about this, who is responsible in this um, in our city. The last thing I would like to say, and this is maybe also not your problem, but, or not your responsibility, but I also wanna make sure that you're aware of this, is I think zero zoning or zero distance zoning was, was um, meant to bring affordable housing into the city, has completely failed, to be honest. It's not working. With that, I'll stop. And sorry for showing my emotions because I think it's really important for the neighborhood here. <clears throat> Thank you. And emotions are not precluded or disallowed. Um, <laughs> what I hope actually to avoid is actual personal arguments that actually have no relevance to the particular issue that we're speaking to. But I think um, we're actually, to okay. And Carolyn, would you like to address the issue of uh, the propane tanks? 
Um, sure. Again, that's a um, a building and fire code issue. So they can't. They. I don't know. I don't want to pretend to know what the separation requirements are. But you, they, the building um, final certificate of occupancy wouldn't be signed if there was a violation of building and or fire code um, as it relates to the proximity of those to either a structure or to another such tank. Right, the certificate of occupancy would not be granted if the fire department and the building commission did not sign off on the utility. Um, does that mean you know, they're completely safe? I don't know, but to at least by state requirements, state mandated in law, they, they are considered safe enough for occupancy. All right, um, Deborah, now you're up. Thank you. Um, I want to um, also thank you for your um, direction. I just want to give one clarification. The person on Liberty Street who just spoke, um, outbidding happens all the time, but in that situation, the people were actually under contract and had a completed inspection. Um, so I just want to clarify that situation. It wasn't just a, a normal kind of com coming along and making an offer. But um, I guess a couple things. One is that I feel like there's some um, kind of benign description of things like that trees are going to be replanted the trees that are coming down are you know 100 125 year old trees and then we're having kind of saplings put up so in terms of you know again thinking about our resiliency you know climate and resiliency um plant sustainability and resiliency um you know this kind of benign language isn't actually accurate in terms of uh what's happening but the other thing is that uh, you know, I hear the kind of, we can't do anything. One thing that I'd like to say that I would love to see city councilors take up and the planning board, whomever, is is looking at the neighborhoods um, with a little more um, subtlety and considering going back to the 75 foot um, frontage because that in and of itself would actually deal with a ton of this where a developer could actually put multiple buildings on a lot, but it wouldn't have quite the same effect on the neighborhood. So I think that is something that city councilors can take up. And I think also what we're seeing is not, this is happening all over the state and all over the country, but there are actually communities in Massachusetts that are putting a lot of effort into reducing teardowns, into um, reducing kind of the, 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 the type of development and the impact on affordability that's happening here. I mean, small A affordability, not capital A affordability. So I think that, you know, we, there, there are actually plenty of precedents around where they're put, putting building moratoriums in place. Um, they did it in Eastern Mass in a number of communities for a year while they just kind of stopped and said, we're going to try to figure out what to do right here. City might worry about getting sued. I don't know, you know, I don't know if it's, this is just about tax dollars coming into the coffers, which I know is a, a need in the city as a, you know, homeowner, I understand that, but I think that I think that there is actually more possibility for real visionary leadership um, in um, addressing the, the the kind of onslaught of changes that we're experiencing in a way that's more um, thoughtful and more advancing of the values that the city has espoused of affordability and sustainability. Um, and I would just really encourage some broader thinking about that. Thank you, um, Jackie. Third bite. Jackie. There we go, there we go. I'm just, I'm just gonna say hi. And I have one more point to make about the special permit issue. Carolyn pointed out that section 1014 was originally meant to describe housing groupings for the cluster developments and the cluster developments all required like four acres of protected land. His developments are just the housing part without the open land. It's, I think in historical context, it's really clear that what he's doing does not, I was gonna say does not fit, does not fit with a, with a history of the zero lot line developments discussion. Cluster developments required, I will repeat, 
three to four acres of open space. And when Hansel adds three to four acres of open space to his developments, I think will be perfect. I hope that made some sense. Sure. Cluster okay. developments. He's got a cluster development housing without the open space. Okay. Uh, you all set, Jackie? Okay. Rue, you're up next. And I just wanted to add um, to what I said before that and make sure that people understand that truly no, this cannot be taken down to us not wanting the people to move in. I have nothing against anyone that's going to move in next to me. I hope I have nice neighbors. Um, Mr. Hansel, I appreciate it if you sold a good to people that you consider to be good buyers because that's what I want to have living, you know, 10 feet from my house. I want nice people. But I feel that that's not a fair assessment of what we're talking about. I also don't think it's a fair assessment to say not in my backyard because this has been going on in my backyard or my front yard, I should say, for about a year. And if my whole impetus was not in my backyard, I would have jumped off months and months and months ago. Um, so for none of us, there are many people on this, on this call. There are many people involved. There are many neighbors who are not going to be having something next to them by the way their house is, and they're still involved. And I did want, Mr. Um, Hansel, you did say that we could ask you a question. And so my question is, how early do you let your workers start working? Because Monday morning- I, 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 uh, I'm gonna- Yeah, yeah sorry, excuse Mr. me, Mr. excuse Mr. me, let me, let me. Let, yeah, I'm sorry. I can't ask we cannot that. direct, you can't, you can't direct questions to him. You're speaking oh, to okay. this, this is hearing so, to us. I and then the question is what time, I mean, this is a zoning thing. It's not about the buy, right? But is there a rule or a, something about what time loud noises can start? I know we have like ending times. Is there a, anything about what time people can start building houses? And if so, there, is, yeah, is there something? There, there is. And Carolyn, would you speak to that, please? Um, yes, and it is, again, it's governed by the building commissioner. Um, so if there are any issues, you should, you can definitely contact the building department. Um, typically at 7 a.m., there can be some permissions given for other times. Um, but any complaints go to the building department. Okay. So Thank then you. I would just like to put out there that I might suggest that we also look at how you go about having that change because if our neighborhoods are going to be being built over the next however many years, it's disconcerting to have it starting at that early in the morning. But the law is being followed. I understand that. I just don't know how we can get that changed. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, uh, this this obviously isn't the forum for that, but uh, if there are means you. And in fact, actually, um, you should speak with your city councilor to have, to discuss that. Um, next up, uh, iPad again. And, and it, as I recall, is that Daniel, you could identify yourself, please. Uh, again, this is Guy Constantine at uh, 42 Guy. Warner Street. Um, just to reiterate, you know, there's obviously a pattern of folks speaking here tonight from the Bay State area. And uh, to say that, it, it, you know, this, it's just not in my, my backyard, it's just a matter of awareness. Um, I think anyone would be speaking about it if it was happening in their neighborhood uh, to be affected by zero lot lines and uh, how they affect the neighborhood from the noise to the gardens to whatever. You know, it, it, it's not about not in my backyard. It's not about we don't want people here. Um, we obviously are understanding and compassionate people. It, it, you know, it's, it's, it's more, it goes beyond that, but we're, we're the ones who are seeing it. So we're speaking out. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Bill Ryan. Thank you, Councilor Dwight. I just wanted to uh, maybe steer you to a transition to what your reports will be. Uh, Carolyn had mentioned that uh, if you wanted to shift something from uh, something by right, which is the zero lot line zoning by right, I think she was referring to that's in the 
URB table, URC table, to um, <clears throat> to the uh, special permits uh, section of the those tables, that you would have to go back and start a whole nother zoning uh, permit uh, initiate or zoning uh, initiation of a change. In my understanding from reading the case law, which I'm not a lawyer, but I I I, I, I read this stuff. Um, seems to indicate that as long as something was pretty thoroughly discussed at the planning board meeting, that they can make recommendations on aspects, of course, related to the subject at hand. Uh, and so uh, something along the lines of what I was discussing about moving zero lot line into the special permit section of table URB or URC would, would be allowed as long as it had been thoroughly discussed. So uh, hopefully it will be thoroughly discussed this evening. Um, just for the record, any any substantive change on any particular order requires an order to be redrafted and resubmitted. Um, if 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 there's a substantive change that's to occur, if the amendments uh, alter it in such a way that it's not, and this is the squishy area and it's the gray area, it, it would trigger. It, it, it would not be considered a valid process and would have to start over again. New clock starts ticking, it gets introduced, and then the uh, more hearings and such like that. So, um, yeah, I'm not quite sure where we are at that point, at least to some of the proposals, and we'll see how it shapes out in, in, the, in the discussion of the debate. I guess we should have asked the solicitor while he was here, but uh, that can still be done. Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Um, anyone else? I will accept the motion from any board member or uh, committee member for to close the public hearing. Move to close the public hearing. Motion's been made by Councilor Thorpe. Is there a second? I second. Seconded by member Elkins. Uh, Laura, would you please call the roll for the closing of the public hearing? Sure. Um, Councilor Dwight. Yes. Uh, Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Maori. Yes. And Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Let me get up to the names of the planning board members. Um, Count, uh, Member Kohout. Yes. Member Elkins. Yes. Member Granat. Yes. Member Tate. Yes. Member Taylor. Member Taylor? Is he still with it's us on the hearing? Bedtime story, he abstains. Okay. Um, member White? Yes. And Member White Hill? Yep. Okay, the, the hearing is closed. As I said, um, now this is the point at which the deliberators may discuss and then ultimately at the end of which should they would make their recommendations or not, that's uh, up to each body. So um, those of you who are not participants, there's Sam, <laughs> okay. Uh, those of you who are not participants, please um, turn off your cameras and keep your microphones muted. That way I can actually see all the people who are participating here as opposed to um, everybody else who's, who we've been having conversations with. So if you could turn off your camera if you're not a voting member here. All right, planning board members and counselors, any thoughts, conversations, questions? I'm, I'm open to hearing. Member White. I have a kind of a clarification question for Carolyn. Um, without getting into the specifics of the example that uh, I guess Bill Ryan showed, you know, there's always with these kinds of um, decisions, some weighing of um, changing the incentives for development and, um, and the, you know, with a more complicated process um, and then giving, you know, letting, you know, just uh, making the rules flexible enough so that, you know, every builder can kind of do exactly the thing that they like doing, I guess. So say there was an example where there was a developer who I don't know if this is correct, but like they like to build 30 foot houses and, and the zoning is by right 28. 
and is it is it correct that they could just go to special permit and still go through that special permit process to do the 30 foot with a different kind of layout and and how would the criteria for the planning board work for the special permit process under zero lot line or uh if there's exceptions i guess to the to the by right uh restrictions um so you would need to set up a special permit path for certain variations. So for example, um, and I don't want to get into, since house, house widths aren't on the table, we're talking about setbacks. Um, you know, let's say um, you wanted to introduce a component that's a special permit that allows a greater reduction in the setbacks um, then that could potentially be done, but you'd want to know under what circumstances would that be appropriate to um, adopt that? And and I will and know. I mean, you know this. Board members know this. Um, that the board is not in the position of designing a project. You review projects that are submitted. So applicants have all different kinds of ways to that they. Um, feel comfortable with the design that they submit, they work on it, they draw it and they submit it to the planning board and the planning board determines if it's meeting certain criteria. Um, so um, there are also, there were some components, uh, it's probably doesn't make sense to get into a, a made up layout um, by someone who doesn't own the property um, because there are just some things that, that you know, aren't, shown in terms of the accuracy, um, but also it's not a real project. But I think the idea is really to think about the flexibility of setbacks. Um, in no other place do we talk about limiting the width of a house for a single family home. Um, so I think you'd wanna think about what is the compelling interest for the city to dictate what a width of a house is. There are many, many houses throughout Bay State neighborhood that's represented here, as well as the rest of the city, that are 26, 35, 38 feet wide, 40 feet wide. So um, uh, I think it, you know it, it certainly would be complicated to um, to try to come up with a number that made sense. So I think it probably makes more sense to think about setbacks and what um, makes sense in terms of the dimensions um, between structures. Chair Koha. Uh, Carolyn, in terms of the ordinance 21217, the move zero lot line from section 1014 over to section 613. So this language, zero lot line, single family sat in a larger umbrella category called special permit, correct? And now we're moving it out of there over to just the table of uses. How, how did that come to be that that language originally was over there in a special, special permit category, if in fact it never really applied to those a stipulation bill. So well, it's not being moved over to the table of use. It's being, we have a section in the zoning that addresses, largely addresses dimensional elements. And some of those things within that chapter six or subsection six um, also trigger special permit based on the table of use code. So flag lots are an example. There are very detailed dimensional provisions for how you need, how, what the definition of a flag lot is and how you lay it out. Um, in the table of use for each district is what dictates whether a flag lot is allowed at all or by special permit. The reason, as I mentioned, you know, 20 years ago, this, uh, uh, I think the original, more than 20 years ago, this, um, their lot line concept was incorporated into a layout for cluster. At the time, cluster was in the same section, was in, there were different parameters that were um, referenced in section 10. Um, one subsection of 10 was a special, it was a cluster and lots of section 10 deals with special permits. 
But later, as the same kinds of concepts that were previously identified in Section 10 were incorporated in other districts and allowed by right, it was just a, a direct reference. Here are all the standards. You're allowed to do this thing called zero lot line as long as you meet all the standards that are already spelled out. Instead of duplicating at that time, 20 plus years ago, duplicating it into the table of use, it was just a reference to 10. But to make it sort of consistent with where a lot of the dimensional elements are located, this is just a recommendation to pull it into that because people are already sort of thinking about dimensional stuff. So put it where people are looking anyway, so it's easier to access. Okay, <clears throat> thank you. So in effect, it as it be, simply by its location, it does not automatically trigger a special permit. It is not protected. The protection that people are seeking of special permit protection it does not apply here anyway. Right, so that, you know, if someone were to say, let's do a special permit process for a certain type of single family home, um, that definitely is a brand new thing and needs to be broadly advertised um, because the idea is it wasn't advertised that we were going to all of a sudden move this to special permit and it may have it, it, that kind of change might have fostered a whole lot a whole different set of people who might be interested in coming to a public hearing carolyn i would like uh, Councilor Jarrett brought up an interesting point and something that we're all familiar with is that um, if you're a developer and you're a Wiley developer, you try to figure out workarounds for particularly with something that you might find to be restrictive zoning. Are we creating more opportunity for workarounds and avoidance of a uh, stricter code or at least the, the ideal or the outcomes we would consider to be more ideal? Um. I think, uh, well, first of all, I'd say anytime you put up a site plan review process or a special permit process, um, um, people will try to figure out a way to avoid that process because it is, creates a burden, it's onerous, and um, there's not a clear path forward. There's not a definitive path forward. Um, and I, I'd say that about any zoning, any time, any regulation of any kind, um, anyone, even homeowners <laughs> who don't want to go to a, the zoning board for a permit for their deck because their deck would encroach into a setback, those homeowners are going to figure out a way to redesign their deck so they don't have to go. They're still going to build a deck and it's going to cover as much areas they possibly can, but they don't want to come to the zoning board or they don't want to do this extra thing. So it's not, um, it affects every aspect of building. Other questions, comments? I mean, it, part of part of the struggle that we're seeing and that we've witnessed in the previous meetings as well is that um, there was one neighbor in particular that is desperate for some type of relief or some type of recognition and acknowledgement of the, their concerns. And unfortunately, it keeps coming up in the context of zoning that doesn't necessarily have any relevance or bearing to the issue that they're describing or what... Uh, clearly, in their mind, zoning as it stands has failed them, and they're looking and they're looking for some form of uh, satisfaction through these debates and the frustration. Regardless of how you can, would you consider their testimony is that that is not has no direct bearing on what we're discussing, and it it, it creates. Well, it's what you witness, uh, the, the, a particular disdain for the, the council, a disdain for the planning board, a uh, disdain for the city generically as, it's, as uh, the malevolent entity that we all know and love. And, and therein lies the frustration of many of these debates and discussions that we have. Um, 
And, and, I, and I suspect that the outcome of this is probably going to pretty much be much the same. And you've heard it and you haven't heard, it's not exclusive here. You've heard that um, people will testify uh, heartfelt, heart-wrenching testimony and then feel they have not been heard. And there's a difference between being heard and, and then essentially uh, positive actions that happen as a result. So that's just, I mean, I, I'm explaining to you something you all know, and I suppose I'm speaking to a broader audience. Therein lies the frustration because I think even Bill Ryan pointed it out, and um, I forgot the gentleman from New York who, who uh, had mentioned that essentially what we do is we're trying to navigate our ways through uh, a series of competing interests with objectives and goals that hopefully have a an outcome that's beneficial to the greater good, at the same time trying to respect and honor the people who feel aggrieved. Um, and, and unfortunately, the solutions are always very unsatisfactory for on all levels. So our job is to actually to deliberate, make recommendations based on the material and the evidence of the stuff that we have before us and make a recommendation based on the issues that we're talking about. And in fact, actually it's required by law. We aren't voting on any other dimension of the zoning. We, we cannot, I mean, debating it here is not appropriate. What we can discuss are the items before us and then make our recommendations accordingly. So who's up? George. Um, Carolyn, I don't know if you can share your screen again, that very last slide where you had two examples of newer homes under construction. Okay. <laughs> yep. Um, all right. Let's see. I'm wondering why you chose those two homes and where those two new homes are. Um, oops. Um, okay, let me just try to get there. Oh, it's not showing up. Um, okay, hang on. Sorry. This stuff's a marvel. <laughs> oh my gosh. That's what we yeah. call it? <laughs> yeah. That's, that's I am custom. definitely in a post-marvel uh, <laughs> Mindset. We're in a Marvel universe. <laughs> yeah. So um, are you talking about this one? Can you see mm, that? Yes, those two. Right. Okay, hold on. Oh, boy. So um, I, for some reason, I can't uh, start the... Okay, well, can you... Is that zoomed up enough? I mean... For this basic... purpose, yeah. Okay. Um, I'm just going to try to expand this a little bit. Um, so I, these were really just, um, I mean, the one on the upper right here is just an example of, oh, sorry. Uh. Okay. So it's just an example of the scale, what the size of a 20 foot width house is okay. just to understand, <clears throat> um, what um, confines someone might have to work within and that it clearly is much narrower than other houses on a block that um, weren't confined to the 15 foot side setbacks on either side. This happened to be a standalone 50 foot wide lot and there are lots of 50 foot wide lots that have been built out throughout the city in even in your urban, urban residential A, B, and C that don't have a 15 foot side setback because when they were built, there was just sort of a judgment call about how far and sometimes the separation between structures are, um, you know, less than 20 feet, um, yep. you know. Yep. So that's that one. Um, the other one is really just to show another example of a built situation in which um, this is a zero lot line project, but yep. this, the, the, um, the the yellow house um this is not in bay state um mm -hmm. the yellow house is um was the existing house the parent 
lot owner that then subdivided the parcel and sold off the lot, but subdivided it as a zero lot line lot because this yellow house is closer than 15 feet to the new shared side lot line there. And the new house is also closer than 15 feet to the lot line. But it, it's just to show um, sort of examples of how this has been used to create flexibility, but without structures actually touching each other. Thank you. So yeah, I just wanted to remind myself that the planning board and especially the planning board, um, we look at issues like this across the whole city. We have to take the whole city into context, um, not to demean any of the love that um, people in Bay State have for their neighborhood, but the implication of our decisions today Im impact the whole city. I imagine both of those lots were empty for the longest time. There's trees there and a nice view of the sky. Um, but then things happened, changed, a new family came in. Um, so I just need to remind, and, and the councilors are like that also, even though you may, many of you represent a ward, you're really thinking of the city um, as a whole. So um, I appreciate those two examples. Chris, member Tate, I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, so what I'm hearing is that the ordinance to move uh, the zero lot line from one section to another is really just a bookkeeping issue. It's not, it's not changing um, what was allowed before. It won't be any different after. Uh, so that's, that's what I'm hearing from that ordinance. Uh, the second ordinance, I'm just, I'm still trying to understand, um, and Carolyn, maybe with the diagrams, you could help me what we're doing. So I understand a zero lot line when the, when the two structures are touching each other, and it's really zero. Are we trying to say that we don't want an in-between state where, you know, maybe one house is three feet off and the other is two feet off, and then there's only five feet in between them? We want to have some minimum distance between the houses. Is that what we're trying to do? Yes. Yeah, so, and and it is confusing um, because it changed from the initial introduction to city council that was referred out for public hearing. But what's in front of you tonight is a proposed language change that would allow this diagram here, if you can see it, um, with two structures that don't meet whatever the standard setback is in the underlying district, either B or C, um, but aren't too close together. So aren't three feet off the lot line. They must have at least in, in the scenario where up to five feet of a reduced setback is uh, if, if the council and planning board make that recommendation to go to full council, that would meet in URB. Um, you'd have a 10 foot setback on either side of this. So for a total of 20. Um, feet in you between can, structures. You can only reduce the setback by five feet. Right. That and in URC, then it would be down to five feet. So you'd have 10 feet between each structure because URC has a smaller setback requirement to start so with. So we're saying it could either be zero or it could be only reduced five feet. Right. Or it could be reduced three feet too, if you can, wanted to. Carolyn, can I, can I recommend you change that to up to five foot reduction in a, the setback? Because this is very sure. ambiguous. Right, I, uh, yeah, I can read it to reducing it to five feet total. Or it, it sounds like you're saying it could be two, three, or it could be three feet, or it could be four feet, or it could be five feet, but no more than five feet. Right. It could be read either way right now. Okay. Um, so reduction and setback of up to five feet. Okay. Is, um, is that an actual, that's a proposed amendment that would, believe it or not, that would, is, uh, is anyone recommending a, an amendment to the language to specify up to five feet? And takers? I, I, I think all the planning board people might be a little wary that we would cause some legislative catastrophe 
for the city council <laughs> or set this back no. on some procedurally in some way that we, we don't, no uh, you won't in fact okay. actually be, because the planning board is, as a body can amend and the legislative matters can amend we're the and then in fact it can be amended once it comes to the council floor so um this is where the this is where the sausage gets made and you're you're welcome to do that I, I would propose then that uh, that um, that amendment to to change the language to uh, what do we say not more than five up feet? to five feet up, up to, to five, five feet. feet sorry, it, it says up to five feet right now. The yellow. It says up to five feet uh, what, reduced. What, what we need to do is change. So it's this is section uh, six point thirteen. Uh, I guess is a two i. Is that right? A <laughs> two Roman numeral i. So this is a, uh, a budding structure on the separate parcel or has a, re a setback reduction of up to five feet rather than a reduced side setback of up to five feet. And, and also uh, the corresponding language on the diagram. Correct. Okay, so, so that is, go ahead, Carolyn. So a reduction in side setback of up to five feet. A side setback reduction. Up to five. I guess you want a side setback. Is it is, is it implicit that it's from the as a bright setback? I guess yes. that is. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, we need an English major. Yeah. Well, it's we need a lawyer. Um, <laughs> we. Uh, so, yeah, hello, I was still, uh, Lawyer Elkins. <laughs> I did what I could, I did what I could. <laughs> yeah. All right, so you, let, let's be clear on what your amendment is then. Um, the, to uh, strike currently has a reduced side setback of up to five feet and in its, uh, in its place, replace it with... Uh, side. Uh, I'll let George go. A side setback reduction of up to five feet. That's the motion, and that's in both the table and on the in the ordinance language. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Uh, member Whitehill has seconded. Uh, motion made by uh, Member Elkins and sort of. Amplified That's by generous credit. <laughs> <laughs> but all right, any discussion on the proposed amendment? Uh, Councilor Shara. Um, is this um, is a similar amendment? Some uh, There are two documents that are attached, and one says AS edits. Are those Alan Seawald edits that he already recommended on this? Yes. Yeah, so there are, so this latest version has some words missing that Solicitor Seawald suggested. So that are, is new from the way that it was initially introduced. So those should be brought forward in any recommendation that you know carries on to council. Okay, so after this discussion, thank you, Council Shara, we will, we will discuss the, uh, the proposed changes in toto from the solicitor. So uh, any discussion on the on the amendments that we currently have on the floor. Laura, you want to do the round robin? Oh, come, uh, uh, George, go ahead. Nope, nope, I, I misunderstood the process. So we need to vote on that language amendment. Okay. To add it as amendment, yeah. Laura? Okay, um, roll call. Uh, Member Kohout? Yes. Member Elkins? Yes. Member Granat? Yes. Member Taylor? Yes. Member Tate? Yes. Member White? Yes. And Member Whitehill? Yes. Okay, are we um, taking a separate vote for the uh, legislative matters or just? Yeah, I mean, it's, it, it, now that oh. we're convened together, we should do us okay. all, I believe, yeah. Okay, uh, Councillor Shara? Yes. Councillor Dwight? Yes. Councillor Maori? Yes. And Councillor Thorpe? Yes. Okay. So that amendment stands. Does uh, anyone want to move Solicitor Seawalt's amendments? <laughs> we're we're going to die of old age if no. 
I move that oh, we okay. accept uh, Attorney Seawold's uh, amendments. Second. And there's a second. So the motion's made by Member Elkins, seconded by Councilor Shara. Uh, any discussion on those proposed changes? George. Well, I don't think we were privy to those changes, right? So, Carolyn, you want to elucidate with boilerplate? Yeah. Sure. Um, so, um, going starting at the top of 21.218 in the first paragraph, um, um, he, he's recommending that um, adding. Um, a definition of a standard setback. So you see there it says the standard setback in quotes. I think you all have that language. Oh, Laura, you're putting it up there. Okay, great, thanks. Um, so uh, modifications to um, uh, standard setback um, and then just wordsmithing throughout that then uses that term standard setback instead of typical or minimum setback. Um, and let's see, uh, and there was also, sorry, before you leave that page, um, a deletion, this deletion where the owner can show maintenance easement as defined below will be granted because then it's all grouped together as maintenance easement in the um, um, final paragraph. Um, sorry. Da, 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 da. Um, Going. Are we to scroll down here? Yeah. Okay. Um, do you have it there? Um, Are we looking for the reference to the maintenance easement in yeah, the final yeah. paragraph? Am yeah. I there yet? Well, um, no, um, go up. I'm sorry. Sorry to be so confusing. It's not in blue Here anymore. <laughs> I think I right. So, right. So, a five foot maintenance easement must be obtained by the owner of a house on a zero lot line from the property owner abutting that lot line in any development pursuant to the items above. So, instead of spelling it out in each of those or in two of those subparagraphs, just consolidated into this B item down here. Um, and did he change the side setback language too that we just voted on? He just he changed yeah. the language uh, from um, minimum to standard setback. So right, it's it was size, just standard. Yeah. yeah, it wasn't the amount. It was just using that standard language instead of uh, minimum or typical. And so the graphics would have to be changed as well. I haven't had time to change the graphics, but the, basically the graphics need to match what the text is. So that's just a matter of cleaning up that um, text. But um, his his well, language I, there is much more clear to me than um, what we had just voted to change. <laughs> you know, why are we looking at these? Now, these changes that <clears throat> they're just coming in front of this, all this language is different than the, the pages that I've looked at for the past two days. Um, it seems a little out of order. Uh, um, so I um, apologize if that wasn't clear. These are the, so the highlighted sections were the things that were changed from the original introduction. And then there were some wordsmithing that came from um, uh, the city solicitor. So um, I think, and I'll just have to go back. Uh, I, I, I don't, I still don't think, I mean, I think the language that you um, just voted on is clear so i don't think you need to worry that it's different than what the um alan seawald may have suggested i think the biggest issue is here that he wanted to just maintain the same term for setback that it's a standard setback it was the criteria that as long as we're not changing the content of the change this is really just uh the communication method of the right. same rule basically. right exactly um 
there are other elements in the change that uh, in um, that all the items highlighted indicate changes that, from the initial introduction to city council. So you all still haven't discussed the idea of changing the double setback that was originally introduced and, and eliminating that, which is under two um, II. Um, so I think it makes sense to discuss that piece of it as well. Um, but otherwise, I think that's the extent of um, Alan Seawald's um, comment. Is the extent. Um, Member Tate, you would you would suggested that um, you had some questions about the language or the proposal, or well, I just think we should, um, if we're going to change the language, we should change it to uh, the most up to date draft in front of us. And make sure it still makes sense. Right. Well, the well, the draft that you see before you is the most current draft. Um, it may not be the draft that you have, though. I, 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 this is the draft I have, but I don't know what the planning board has in there. So, Chris, we, um, we had something slightly different. Okay. So, uh, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna um, put forward an amendment that we change the aforementioned amended text to has a reduction from the standard setback of up to five feet. Uh, is there a second to that? Second. And who was it? I can't see actually anymore, no. It was Jana. Jana. Oh, Jana, okay. So Jana, Jana second. Member White <laughs> just seconded Member White Hill. And uh, discussion on that. And Carolyn, can you give me back the Brady Bunch screen so I can see everybody? So I don't know. Um, uh, Laura, can you drop that? Sure. There we go. Thank you. Uh, discussion. George. So, yeah, I'm really, <clears throat> I'm trying to get back to my screen now. I'm really, to be quite honest, not comfortable uh, moving forward on this. I think. Uh, a lot of members of the public spent some time looking at the draft that wasn't the current draft that we're looking at now to approve. Um, and I'm trying to go back and forth between Laura's screen and my screen of my original to see what really changed. Um, so, and, and again, uh, I know this is throwing a wrench into the legislative process. Is our clock ticking in some fashion? I don't want to do a joint, another joint hearing, um, but I think this is if Carolyn's also going to change the diagrams on page two um, that other folks have really looked at. It uh, it seems a little bit out of order to me. So, George, if this helps, uh, the solicitor has joined us. I, I've coaxed them back on uh, via text. Uh, Alan, if you there, you are. So the, the question, some of the concerns are, you may have heard that um, uh, the planning board hasn't an opportunity to review the changes that you have proposed. And maybe, first of all, it would help if you could give an explanation of the changes that you're suggesting. And you're muted, you're muted there. There you go. Well, I haven't... Um... Let me just say that uh, my changes to this document were simply to make it uh, clearer in what was being required and uh, changing phrases like normal setback to a phrase that was defined as standard setback, which is defined as meaning uh, the setback that's required in the zoning district. So. There were there was no substantive changes that I made. So, um, do you want me to walk through the document? Um, I think we did that um, okay. with your changes, and we talked about the maintenance easement and the switch for that. But George, just to be clear, the graphics that were presented in the public hearing all showed the 
concept it's just a matter of wordsmithing changing from standard setback from minimum setback to standard setback so it's not changing the idea or the concept that is is on the table so it's just a matter of creating consistent language um, from one to the other but um, and that's all I meant by saying I have to update the graphics because I didn't have a chance to go in and and change the word the text in the graphic to match the change to standard setback but it's all about you know just making that language standard setback consistent is 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 there a current uh, a particular provision that I changed that was of some concern? Um, there was there is an amendment that that has been made that actually does um, employ the the setback definition terms that's currently before us. Uh, Member Whitehill has has made a an amendment change which I think is relatively benign and actually helpful. But if if um, does anyone have any subsequent confusion that possibly the solicitor might could speak to? Um, are the, and George, do you still hold? I mean, you're kind of concerned about moving forward because of the, the language change amendments. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Just because there was a lot of strikeouts and a lot of uh, a lot of changes that uh, I can't really see um, on my two screens here, um, you know, I I don't want to stand in the way of this. I'm just one vote, um, and and I know it's all about timing and, and when the uh, attorney can get comments back to us. But uh, I I just didn't get to be prepared for this um, latest revision, so it's. Uh, it's, it's just a little difficult for me. Um, and I, I think it's, to be quite honest, unfair to the public too, that they were looking at very different documents, different language, um, not, not substantively different around the concepts of the zoning changes that we're looking at, but just that the documents were not what we're voting on today. Um, but uh, again, I agree that they're not substantive that I can see at this point. So. Um, if we want to move forward, let's do that. Um, Alan, can you speak to George's concerns? I mean, because, I mean, uh, essentially, uh, the, the, and in fact, actually, the public discussion didn't actually hinge on any of this, to be perfectly honest, um, that I recall. But um, is it possible that we are vulnerable to... Um, a challenge if somebody considers that the the your recommendations not everyone had an opportunity to look at the recommendations that you had made that they would somehow affect the ability for us to render a decision that would be considered uh, appropriate under open meeting law. Oh, it's not inappropriate under open meeting law. No, you know, no drafts have to be attached to the notice. I mean. Uh, we provide documents attached to our notices, you know, in an effort to be as open as possible about the process. And, um, you know, I received this this week. I wasn't aware um, that this was being heard. Uh, and so I received that this past week and I turned it around the same day I got it. And, um, uh, but I, I will say again, nothing that I did to alter this uh, in any way, change any of the concepts. I was just trying to clarify the language, you know, sort of make it as clear as possible what was being intended, uh, as opposed to, and I remember the phrase, normal side setback, and I didn't know what normal meant, so I defined the term, that sort of thing. Um, and just tried to move things around and be more concise. Member Elkins. Um, I, I'm assuming that that whether to uh, re recommend to recommend this legislative uh, this legislation at, at this point is just that it's a recommendation that the words thing right. would continue regardless. That's right. Um, I um, I mean I think if there is a concern about the latest draft, I 
or, 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 or that these changes weren't seen, A, I don't, I think, you know, we could not incorporate them into what we are recommending at this point, and these changes could be addressed at the, at the next stage of things. That being said, um, I think it's just good legislative drafting to have definitions uh, that are laid out, then uh, continue to be, you know, used throughout the, the legislation. Um, and so I don't, I, this strikes me as something that would just be part of the, the process to fix at some point. So, um, but I, I think if there's concern that the public hasn't had an opportunity to review what was before us tonight or or any individual board members i i personally don't i don't unless i'm wrong about this i don't think i see anything that if we didn't incorporate attorney seawald's changes for tonight that they couldn't be incorporated at the at the next stage without a tremendous amount of not to not to push work and time and debate uh onto another uh you know to pass the buck so to speak but to me the substance of the recommend of, of of what we're talking about tonight, I'm prepared to vote on. And if this if these revisions were to hang that up, then I would suggest abandon the revisions for tonight and, and move them along to the next stage. Mr. Com Com Council Shara is next, so hang on now just a sec. Council Shara. I just wanted to so I just wanted to make sure that I understood what happened. So they were these revisions were attached to the council. The legislative matters agenda, but they weren't attached to the planning agenda. Is that correct? Okay. Right. We we never put. Uh, we don't typically post the actual language on the agenda anyway. Right. It lives elsewhere, so it's not something that's typically done anyway. Okay. Whereas we usually we often right. do if we can. So, right. so the public did have access to it just they would have had to have looked at the council at the legislative matters agenda to have access to it. Right, and then there was a glitch about that, but there was one posting and then it got, and then it was changed. But, um, it, it, you know, either way, the substances of the change were described in this public hearing. It was, you know, and this amounts to those, you know, wordsmithing, but as a, as, um, uh, Marissa Elkins described, you know, thing words get added all along, right, in your legislative review process, even onto the council floor. So um, those could be changed at a later date as well. I feel comfortable moving forward. I'm sorry, who was that? Sam? Sam. Is that you? Oh, okay. Uh, Alan, you wanted to comment? I, I just want to uh, let me just respond to what Carolyn said. She's entirely right. You know, this is an, an ongoing process. Uh, and, you know, to, uh, uh, you know, just to piggyback on what uh, Member Elkins uh, said, this is a legislative process. It's an ongoing process of changing language. And so you could have voted to recommend changes to the language from the, on the floor tonight. And, and just as Carolyn says, that carries right through, through the city council, because as you know, a, an amendment could be proposed on the floor and, and no one had that beforehand. Um, that's just the nature of the process. And so I want to assure that there is not a problem with going forward with either language, with the language that was amended as I amended it or what came before, or if there's something that you want to add or subtract, uh, that's all within the realm of possibility. And I would say this is only a recommendation, particularly for the planning board. This is just a recommendation and uh, the city council can say thank you, but no thank you to your recommendation. Who knows? It's, uh, so there's nothing to challenge. Well, we do have an amendment on the floor. So the, an amendment of the motion was made. There you go. Uh, uh, discussion on that amendment. Any, any, uh, does everyone remember what it was? Uh, Member Whitehill had actually uh, recommended actually clarifying language attached to uh, solicitor's amended language that would help uh, amplify. 
Any, any further discussion on that amendment? Uh, Laura, call the roll on that, please. Okay. Um, Member Kohau. Uh, to Member Whitehill's amendment about the language, yes. Member Elkins. Yes. Member Granat. Yes. Member Taylor. Yes. Member Tate. Yes. Member White. Yes. Member Whitehill. Yes. Member uh, Councilor Shera. Yes. Councilor Dwight. Yes. Councilor Mayori. Yes. And Councilor Thorpe. Yes. All right. So the language is amended. Um, barring any other amendments, um, maybe we should move forward and work on our recommendations. How's that? Just, just in the interest of of getting out of here before two o'clock in the morning. Yeah. Uh, just yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Um, Let me. Can I ask Carolyn one please. more question about the ordinance, Carolyn? In many of the diagrams, many of these scenarios are about property that's held in common ownership where the, the zero lot line comes into play. If uh, the zero lot line then uh, structures are built, those properties then could be sold off so they're not under common ownership anymore, correct? There's nothing that ties the zero lot line to that combined ownership. Correct. Did it could be sold off at any time once it's created. So if you go through the A&R process and write on there, this is zero lot line, the owner could then say, okay, I'm selling this lot and having someone else build according to the plans that I've just established. Even though then um, the lots are not under common ownership, they can still build the house along the zero, the zero lot line stipulations. Right, so you could you so, you set up the as long as you set up all the criteria for that you know if there's a required maintenance easement and and that and so forth, and you, um, you record on the plan. Typically, we require people to record on the plans. This is their lot line. Here's the setback. Here's where the um, structure is going to be located. Here, are the where the trees are going to be located, and that kind of thing. So it's the buyer beware when he or she buys that parcel. <clears throat> right. Okay. Member Tate. Uh, one structure is built on the lot line, a zero lot line. Can um, the other structure on a uh, parcel under common ownership be built with the five foot redec reduction in the standard setback? Or would it have to have the regular, the standard setback in that case? Good catch. So, so if there, if um, um, I'm the property owner and I create another lot next to me, and, and now I have a shared lot line with a new structure, that structure gets built, and then I want to do an addition to my house and come closer to that side lot line. Well, you could, um, couldn't you create the zero lot line on the existing house? Yes, the whole thing is that that one um, side, that one lot line is um, ha it has the provision on both sides of the line. Right, it's the shared line that then can be subject to this um, uh, provision. So like in that the picture that you showed us of the skinny house. Oh, no. No, it's no. the newer construction next to the the older home that had been uh, that had subdivided right. the parcel, and because the older home was then in you know closer than the right than, exactly right yep okay yep I didn't use complete sentences, so if anybody needs me, to <laughs> I still don't follow. Is there a condition where you can where there's a a lot line and one structure is on the lot line, so zero feet from the lot line? And the other structure is five feet less than the standard setback from that same lot line. Well, under current conditions, that could be allowed, but this change would no longer allow that 
you'd have to create a situation, it, it eliminates that option. And you'd have to be able to draw the new lot line so that you only had up to a five foot reduction <laughs> in the standard setback. So if we were in a, a zoning district that had a 15 foot standard setback, the closest two structures could be together would be 20 feet. Right. Or zero feet. Or zero, right. But nothing in between those two numbers. Right. And I, I just feel for the, the public that spoke, um, and the language wasn't personally clear to me. Um, I think from what I was hearing from the Bay State community was they were really worried about these houses that are being built 10 feet apart right. from each other. So it sounds like these changes that we're voting on tonight would actually make that not possible. And Correct. Have, uh, um, in the case of a 15 foot side setback, they would be no closer than 20 feet together. Right, from uh, building to building. And, and I'm also hearing that it was never a special permit process. It was just in that section. And yeah. what we're voting on would not change that substantially. We would just reorganize where something is Correct. in this plan ordinance. Correct. Okay, thank you very much. Good discussion. Any other questions or comments? Uh, I would just uh, I would just briefly say that I I'm in I'm in favor of, of moving this provision as it says just uh, not to be all lawyer about it, but uh, when people are learning are trying to use these regulations, this is uh, well. It's two things. One is is that the people needing to understand what they uh, can can and cannot do and, and what's required. I think this makes it much clearer. It's much more intuitive um, to to put this provision in this way. I also think because of the way it was previously, it was a little mis, I don't want to say misleading, but it was, uh, I can see why people would look at it the way it was and, and be uh, confused about the role that the planning board and zoning law would would play in and and permit process and all of that could play in these circumstances and I think uh, that it is a a good move to to take a step that that makes it uh, just easier uh, and more readily apparent to to people who aren't digging in the weeds understand what they can do with a development project but are instead are abutters and just concerned about what's going on in their neighborhood to to be able to just read these regulations and understand where where we are in the process and the discretion that the that is is and what's happening at the planning board level and so forth so i'm in favor of these uh changes to attorney elkin's point that which is an excellent point is that unfortunately a lot of people were hanging their hats on the fact that this was a protective uh this would afford them a protection that they they thought they had that they did not have and by moving it in its proper place in the, in the code book, it wouldn't it wouldn't give that suggestion at least in the, in their case of fall. <laughs> and it's a more appropriate to uh, one for people who are planning to sell or develop their property, and also for people who are willing to contest it. But it's in a, that they all have they're all reading the same rules the same way, and also for planning board for their for their subsequent review. Um, any other discussion on both these items. If not, I'd accept a motion from, well, let's start with legislative matters. I would accept a motion from legislative matters. We have a positive recommendation. Second. Um, uh, the motion's been made by Council Sharon, seconded by Councilor Thorpe and Laura. Uh, I don't think we've made, um, taken a vote to accept the changes that were made by Attorney Seawald. I, have recorded votes on two you're, different amendments. You know what, you're um, absolutely right. And and can I just say, I think it's also necessary after it came out of community resources, there were changes, it, they're actually combined changes made by both attorney Seawald and Carolyn Mish from the way it was originally introduced at council um, after. So I think it's necessary to accept both the changes 
their combined changes and not just the changes of Attorney Seawald. Am I correct, Carolyn, that out of community resources is when the change was made to um, allow the flexibility to reduce the standard setback? Um, right, right. So that's what was... I'm hoping I'm not confusing this more, but um, all I know I is that so. it's changed since it came out of council originally, since it was originally referred. Carolyn, right, those are the... Yeah, those are the changes so that I was describing that were in highlighted yellow, that yes. all the changes that were moving forward that included Solicitor Seawald's comments as well. So all of that is is there. Um, yeah. uh, and and so I, um, I, you know, and that's what was presented tonight, mm -hmm. except for the wordsmithing part of the, you know, the standard setback. Right. Um, well, how about this? I'll accept it. Well, we can do it one or two ways. So we can advance it as everyone understands it, or we can advance it as the language that's been presented and the, in, encompassing both Solicitor Seawald and which we still, as, as Laura rightly points out, we still have a motion on the floor to that extent, but we could add to that or modify it to include all changes proposed by the community resources and Solicitor Seawald, which are which you saw presented to you. Um, what's the what's the group's pleasure? I, I mean, I think it was my amendment. Can I revise my my sure thing? Um, you not, can do whatever you want. Yes, I, you may. I I propose that we uh, vote to recommend with all of the um, amendments and uh, changes made. By Attorney Seawald and the, uh, sorry, the community uh, resources. Resources, sorry, yeah. it's getting late. Uh, the it's okay. community resources, so that all all the proposed amendments are encompassed in what we vote to recommend or not. Laura, Laura, what, just what's clarify on? that it's the combined changes of Carolyn Mission and Attorney Seawald. It wasn't actually the community resource right. made these suggestions, were, but they didn't actually. They were, vote right. to um, make changes there. Is there a working version right now that I can point to and say, I vote we, I would like to move that we. Yes. It's the version to attached this. to the agenda. Yeah, it's the, it's the iteration that we've been looking at and it's been highlighted in yellow with red deletions and, uh, and such like. So right. um, that version is and Laura's right. Those are recommendations that Carolyn made after the discussion in community resources, and not essentially community resources recommendations that are Carolyn's, along with Solicitor C. Walsh that he's presented that we've that we've also discussed already. And to be perfectly frank, all those changes that we saw that we've been discussing, those are those are the combined amendments that. It, and we should have, and this is on me. I should have actually introduced them right up front, and then we should have discussed the um, addition of those. So it's coming a little late to the game. But what, what's principally my concern is that everyone understands exactly what we're voting on and why we're voting on it. And so I want to make sure everyone's clear on this. So the amended changes, and Laura can actually put them up. The changes from Carolyn and from Solicitor Seawald is this iteration here, <coughs> excuse me, coming any second now, I'm yes, to know more, second. it's all right, it's okay, don't worry, you're doing great. And I appreciate I you, you keeping like, us. Do... Sure, go ahead. I guess I'm wondering why we have to ad adopt amendments or adopt the language recommendation or when what we're doing is voting to recommend it substantively, as opposed to saying this is the specific ling, you know, uh, legislation. Well, I would, the, yeah, my answer to that is, is that we have to be clear that we're all talking about the same thing. And if there is any confusion, and there turns out there was some confusion, that, that we're all literally on the same page and voting on the same page would be helpful. Well, okay, so this is this is what like, I'd actually like to withdraw my motion, and sure. I think what might be uh, appropriate is that uh, maybe somebody uh, from from the legislative committee 
uh, who knows exactly what iteration and have laid eyes on. I mean, I because I'm looking this up now, but somebody who, so I'm going to withdraw my motion, not because I'm not in favor of proceeding, but I, if there's some, if somebody can put forward exactly what you're talking about, that, that, so that we Fair are enough. very clear. Fair enough. Um, is there anyone in LM who is interested in making a motion supporting this language and moving it forward as amended? Move to approve uh, the, as amended. Thank you. Uh, Council Maori, is there a second? Second. And a second from Council Shara. Uh, any discussion on the motion? And Laura, can you blitz through the roll call and we'll see how that goes? Laura, let me stop sharing. Okay, one second. I'm sorry. It's, uh, and spin a few more plates if you could while you're at it. That'd be great. <laughs> um, member Kohal. Um, so I don't often do this, but I'm going to abstain because I don't feel like I've had time enough to look at the iteration that we're talking about. So um, I feel like substantively we should move forward, but I'm not ready to. Uh, vote in favor. So I'm abstaining. Okay. Member Elkins. Yes. Member Granat. Yes. Member Taylor. Yes. Member Tate. Yes. Member White. Yes. Member Whitehill. Yes. Councilor Shara. Yes. Councilor Dwight. Yes. Councilor Mayori. Yes. And Councilor Thorpe. Yes. Okay, the motion passes with one abstention. Now to the main body, the recommendation. And uh, Councilor Shara, you want to repeat it? You did make a motion to, to recommend to the full council. Um, uh, move a positive recommendation. Second. And it was second That's by Councilor Thorpe. Yep, thank you. Uh, this is for L uh, for legislative matters. Uh, roll call. Oh, any discussion? I'm sorry. Roll call, please, Laura. Councilor Shara. Yes. Councilor Thorpe. Yes. Councilor Mayori. Yes. And Councilor Dwight. Yes. And George, I'll leave it to you to to um, ask your body about a recommendation. Well, <clears throat> let me just clarify. The previous vote that we went through was just to accept a certain document that we're, uh, now I'm confused. Well, I'm sorry, yes. What we just voted on was to advance the amendment language, which you have stand on, to from the, uh, from, okay. from, from the original document, the, this incorporated the changes from the solicitor and uh, the, the changes that Carolyn made after talking with community resources. So, so tell me how is that different than this vote about recommending those same amended changes? Um, well, that's just, council. that's that essentially modified the document and defined what document we're advancing with recommendation. So now we have the, uh, we've accepted the recommend, we've accepted the changes and that's incorporated in what would be the recommendation. If, if you feel that this has been altered in such a way that it, it shouldn't be forwarded or you disagree with any item on it, it shouldn't be forwarded, but this is, we are, we just approved in legislative matters to advance the version that Laura just displayed and the one that we just approved to the uh, council of the favor rec favorable recommendation. So the planning board needs a motion to recommend moving, to recommend approval, recommend moving this forward to the city council. Exactly. So we're waiting for a motion from one of the planning board members. So moved. Second is. Thank you. It's been made um, motions. Can, can, can you identify who made the motion and seconded for Laura to put down in the minutes? Uh, Jana White uh, mo made the motion and Marissa Elkins seconded. There we go. Thank you. So if Laura's still here, you've done a great job of calling the roll call so far, Laura. Want to keep it going? Sure. Um, Member Kohout. I'll abstain. 
Member Elkins. Oh, you're muted. Yes. <laughs> Member Granat. Yes. Member Taylor. Yes. Member Tate. Yes. Member White. Yes. And Member Whitehill. Yes. So yeah, you guys have done yeoman's work and um, you've, you've had to participate in this extra meeting. You got another meeting coming up soon. Um, you don't have to stick around and watch us discuss uh, parking management stuff. You're welcome to, as I said, it's, it, it can be riveting, but it, you know, <laughs> to, a, to a certain mindset, but. Um, <clears throat> Is there a public uh, comment? <laughs> uh, yeah, there's public comment. Absolutely. Yes, there is public comment to those items. Absolutely, there is. Right. Um, those are not hearings. Those are those will actually be just the discussion of a recommendation. This is these are recommendations that follow the hearing. <clears throat> we have to formally sign off. Is there What's a that, motion? Sam? Is there I a motion? That we adjourn the planning board. The, the motion's been the... made to adjourn the planning board. Is there a second? There is. Sam, Sam seconds it, okay, at 10.15. I'll call the roll this time. Uh, Member White? Yes. And David Whitehill? Yes. And Marissa? Yes. And Chris? E Chris, stop. <laughs> yes. Chris, sorry. Chris, Chris Tate? Yes. And Krista Grant? Yes. And Sam Taylor? Yes. It's unanimous. Thanks, planning board members. Thank three. you all. Thank you all yeah, very much. You. I appreciate it. Yeah. And I, and I would stay, but. Yeah, yeah sure thing. I bet. But yeah, <laughs> all right. They're not used to pushing okay. past 10 like we are. <laughs> yes, I know. It's all right. So uh, thank you all, uh, all of you and LM, too. Um, it's been a long night and it will be a little bit longer. Uh, right now, we have also referred to us as of the last meeting, uh, 21240. This is an ordinance relative to parking on Front Street. Um, and this, do we have anyone from transportation parking here tonight? Or any, or the sponsor? No. Uh, not anymore. We did earlier. I could probably answer basic questions since I've been following it since my ward. Yeah, that was okay. That's helpful, but it will be helpful. Um, <laughs> these are changes to both Front Street and uh, 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 from Florence Street and also to Graves Avenue. Um, let's see, and, and I'll read it just for it's a, a parking prohibition. And the location is Front Street Westerly from Florence Street to Grove Street. So parking, and then also Front Street Easterly uh, from Florence Street to Grove Avenue. Um, come Move to me, or Oh, can we put it on? Oh, go go ahead. Forward? Yeah. Move no, positive I'll, recommendation. I'll that. Is there second. a second? Second. Okay. Council Maori, why don't you take right. us through this? Well, here. so Front Street, you know, that's it's to me, it's a no brainer. If you do, if you can picture that street, it's a real hairpin uphill hairpin. There really should never be parking on there. And um, so this kind of just um, formalizes that. And then the uh, graves has been an area of concern for a long time. And I've talked to many residents on that, the dead end uh, side that where the bike path um, has an entrance. And uh, so grave, grave gets narrows pretty dramatically at that end. So to me, that's pretty straightforward. Uh, it, it would be making permanent the um, parking restrictions that were temporary down there at that part um, last, last summer. Uh, and then, there's, you know, there's, uh, so then there's uh, some seasonal parking, parking, I don't know if it's this one, there's some seasonal parking, I'm looking at the... the Are we board. moving these as a group? Yeah, I mean... Uh, yeah, um, I'm going into another yeah, section, so maybe I should stop. Yeah, only front well, is on right, the just, floor. Just, oh, okay, excuse me. You said grave. So front street... Going so, on about grave. <laughs> so I understand that, that 
that uh, the issue on Front Street um, essentially what inspired this was uh, principally the issues surrounding people using access to the river from last summer. Is that the concern? Yeah. Um, then I, is it safe to presume that uh, butters and, and neighbors in the neighborhood are in favor of this? Yes, Front Street. I have. Uh, it's it's been unanimous. There's no one. No, I've never heard an opponent to restricting parking on that on Front Street because of its um, structure. I mean, it, you know, it's it's up a sinewy uphill. Um, there's really no safe way to park on Front Street. We don't have a map, do we? Up the no, unfortunately, we don't. We'll oh, I can map. probably dig one up, though. I have. I mean, it. I can look one up on Google Maps. But usually, you know, sometimes no, I, we'll I get... have. I have the maps from transportation and parking, though. Maybe I could do that. Councilor Jared. Councilor Jared has joined us as well. Oh boy. Councilor Jared, while Councilor Mayor is looking for the map, do you have anything to add to the this conversation? Sure, I uh, sent the link to the maps to Laura. Wow, okay. you're so oh, fast. goodness. How are you so fast? Um, He's, he was waiting for this all I night. No, you have to show me up. Okay, I'm That's looking great. My yeah, the maps box. really help. Um, was it a while ago you sent it, Councilor Jarrett, or just, re just now? Uh, just now in the chat as a direct. Oh, message. in the chat. Okay, thank you. I'm looking at in my inbox. Um, okay. Let's see. Oh. Um, no. No, it's there. I'm just not Send quite it. Sure. Do you want to try sending it to me? Um, can you get it from the chat? I don't see it in the chat, but. Oh, you maybe. don't see it in the chat. Okay. Counselor Jared, if you could send um, it to me, maybe that'll. Okay, wait a minute. I, I am. No, there you go. I've got it. Hold up. While we're doing this, I would just like to make a request of transportation parking in the future as these things get sent forward to us. Uh, it shouldn't be expected that any one of the members should come and represent. We should at least have something a little more than the code language we should actually a map be very helpful um and then also someone who is capable of at least discussing this because well, if we come to it cold it really is it's we're not doing what we should be doing almost there hold on one sec everyone can see yep yeah. Yeah, and what you can't see is that's all uphill as well. Right. I haven't visited it. Right. And currently, essentially, there's there are no restrictions, and it's not posted. It's it just stands as folks park there, and that well, fundamentally frankly, blocks the road. Correct, and frankly, it's never been an issue because I I, I mean I don't think people generally would park there. It, it doesn't. I think it's only because of the crowding in the summer and more desperation that people actually have um, tried, you know, attempted to park on there. I haven't seen it a lot, though. Perhaps others have. Um, I've, I've seen one end of it. I haven't seen it go all the way up the street, but I, I've <laughs> gone up the street because it can't go up the street. <laughs> it's people are parked there, so. Yeah. Um. Any other, any members have any questions about this? Currently this has a, uh, on the floor, we have a favorable recommendation. Um, any other discussion on that? Laura, roll call please. All right, can I just ask who was the second on uh, Councilor Shara's motion? Was it you, Councilor Mayori? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, Councilor Dwight? Yes. Um, Councillor Shara? Yes. Councillor Mayori? Yes. And Councillor Thorpe? Yes. Thank you. Uh, that, that passes with a positive recommendation. Next up, we have the uh, 
This is an ordinance 21241. This is relative to parking on Grove Avenue. Um, and this is a, pro, a parking prohibited at all times on Grove Avenue westerly, a point 50 feet uh, southerly of Evergreen Road to the dead end. And, and then also easterly. Also section two, Grove Avenue easterly to, from Evergreen Road to Front Street. No parking any time from May 1st of any year to September 30th of the same year. Wow, boy, that talk about prosaic language, but okay. Um, <laughs> uh, do we have a map for this by any chance? Uh, Council yeah, Sarah? we do. I'll or put Council it Sarah? Okay. Council Mayori, what would you, what can you tell us, us about this? Right, so it's it's um, the seasonal parking. Um, this is a place where we, you get um, excessive amount of, of parking in the in the summer months, and so um, you know this this one isn't. Um, as straightforward as as um, as the front street because um, there are a few renters who park on the street, um, maybe maybe even property owners I don't know, but um, and so there's some there's some uh, debate about um, when you restrict parking, but by but by restricting parking seasonally, um, you're you're kind of allowing. Um, you're, you're allowing um, uh, the street to be clearer. Um, the other pushback that can happen is folks on Evergreen and Upland get concerned that the parking will then come onto their street. You know, this is something that may happen or may not. It's that, that that's a concern I've been, I've, um, I've heard. I personally will, I'm, I'm, I'm supportive of this. I think it's a place to start. I mean, the seasonal, you know that is something that we can be re can be explored and, lo and looked at again in a few years if that particular you know that that side versus another side um, there are, this is a situation where tweaks could be made it's not, it, there's some safety concerns but this is really about uh, I mean the dead end side of Grove is really just safety it's very narrow this side is not as narrow the one that goes you know towards Front Street um, but um, but by having seasonal bands, you're, you're allowing for uh, traffic to flow more properly and for people to walk because people come out of the bike path and are walking kind of in the middle of, that, of the street a lot. Um, so I, I'm, I'm kind of, you know, personally going to, um, you know, I support this because I think something needs to be tried on, on the street. Um, is there a motion for this? Uh, move to approve. M okay. Excuse me. Move to recommend. Is there is there a second? Second. Okay. Question, okay. Council Mayor. Yeah. Are the residents, uh, Council Thorpe. Are the, sorry. Are the residents in that neighborhood aware of this? Um, I've sent out lots of newsletters, and a lot of them were there for transportation and parking. Um, the transportation and parking uh, meeting. So I, I think that they are they're um, aware at that level. Whoever uh, is tuned in at, to that level, a lot of this was in place in, in a temporary form last summer. So, um, oh yeah, I think, uh, member Tate. member Tate actually yes because we're 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 a little more wide open as far as public conversation. So you have a question on this? Hi, Chris Tate. Uh, I live at Forty Six Upland Road in Leeds. Yeah. Um, so I'd like to speak as a uh, neighborhood member. Um, I, I have noticed, uh, first of all, I was trying to get your attention with Front Street. Uh, I agree with your recommendation for that one. That's, yeah, no one should ever be parking on that street. And there's a bus route that goes right down it. Right. Bus stop on that street. Um, so the restriction there is uh, makes a lot of sense. Um, I also, this is the first time I'm seeing uh, this, proposal. Um, I know that that neighbors have had a lot of, uh, you know, especially on Grove, a lot of concerns with the parking. Um, do you like the idea of it being seasonal? 
along that side. I, I agree with Councillor Maori that the dead end section should be restricted. Um, and I like that you're not restricting it on the, I guess we call the renter side of Grove, um, but you are restricting it seasonally on the other side. I think that makes a lot of sense just with um, how narrow that, that is if you had cars parked on both sides of it. Um, and I will just kind of voice, you know, my concern, I, I do have worries that um, some of these restrictions are, uh, you know, I just hope that our neighbors aren't, well, I don't know. I, I think these, these restrictions as, as uh, put forward, I, I view in a positive light, but I hope we're not trying to um, limit folks from out of the neighborhood, from coming into the neighborhood to use the river. That's my only concern with these restrictions. Um, but, but I actually like what we've done here as kind of a middle ground. So that's all. I just wanted to give my input as a, uh, as a neighbor since there, there don't seem to be anyone, any of us here tonight. I very much appreciate that, Chris. I think that that, that, that actually speaks to some of my concerns. I mean, I want, if we're going to make parking restrictions, I want them to actually be based on safety, not on uh, presumptive ownership of the street by and nor uh, presumptive ownership of the neighborhood. And then, um, I mean, often we hear people that they want to restrict parking because it's they can't park there or they don't want people to park in front of their house because they prefer not to see cars in front of their house. That concerns me, and it also, as we all know, this is this is <clears throat> comes this arose out of uh, um, real stressors and conflicts that existed, and for for a variety of reasons. But the fact is, is that um, this is a public street; it's owned by the public and may be used by the public. And if as a public street, it's not doing its job as a public street, whereas the people can't pass, as in the case of Front Street, makes perfect sense. That I agree with. And I think to Chris's point, which I, he knows this better than I do and Council Mayor, you do as well, if these make sense, if they're practicable and make sense, as far as safety features, I'm in favor. If they are restrictive in any other way, in a way that people are prepared to say or not say aloud, then I'm again it. And that really, that concerns me because we have these pressures in every neighborhood. Every street has, has uh, these streets were built for much narrower cars, for uh, they, they used to be private roads. They, they were not designed to accommodate other traffic, but it does, uh, there is a sense of possessiveness that um, that is presumed, but is not entitled and not embedded. So uh, Council Sherry, you had your hand up. So I stopped ranting here. Um, I didn't have a chance to look this up in the code, but does anybody know where else we do seasonal restrictive parking? The only place, I mean, not seasonal, but the only other restricted, well, no, that's permit parking. I was gonna say around Smith. Right, that's different. Yeah, that's different. You're saying seasonal. Yeah, I don't, I'm not aware. I don't know. Because that would be a significant precedent to set if this is the first place that we're doing a seasonal restriction. Yeah. I cannot think of any circumstance where we, where we have seasonal part, and particularly a season where there's no snow, <laughs> right? right? I mean, usually you would think that a seasonal restriction would be applied to streets that could become impassable with snow banks start to build up. Right. But that's not an issue here, right? That's not the issue here. This issue is a season when people might use the river for swimming. I believe that's problematic. Right. I, I believe um, Director Scalia is also proposing seasonal restrictions uh, in Ward 5 around the swimming holes as well, around Cross Street. Is that correct, uh, Councilor Jarrett? I don't know if can we recognize you. <laughs> yeah, he, he's recognized. Okay. Alex, go ahead. Um, that, that, that was discussed at transportation and parking, but it hasn't been introduced to council yet. Oh. Um, I'm not sure if they'll be seasonal or permanent. Oh. Um, it may, may just be permanent. Um, I do find in the code section 312.105, uh, seasonal parking restrictions. 
and they are all on Main Street. Um, and there are no parking between 2 a.m. and 7 a.m. from December 1st of any year to April 1st of the following year. So they do seem to be about uh, snow. And those actually are carryover ordinances, I believe, from before we had established rules about snow emergency. It used to be there was a universal ban uh, for all on-street parking in the winter. Um, and then about 25 years ago, that, that was thought that was impractical, and it was. And so we created the snow emergency um, standard. But um, OK. Um, any other discussion on these? Councilor Jarrett, do you have any more? Or, or Council Mayor, go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, that's OK. I was just going to say um, uh, to, to, to Krista, you know, I share your concerns. And uh, you know, we've. I, Others in the neighborhood um, who have, have those concerns have been talking about alternative parking, and we're looking into it. You know, could you park, have have folks park at the elementary school in the summer? You know, these are questions we need to have answered. Where else can we provide parking um, so it doesn't you know, it isn't so much trying to keep the flout? Um, so when I walked with the director, she she kind of showed me the safety issues, but but I hear you on that. I, I, I share the same concerns and we'll have to see how it you know, plays out, I guess. Chris. I, I will say if you're worried about setting um, summer parking precedents, uh, seasonal precedents, um, that other side of Grove Street that you were uh, proposing the, the seasonal parking, it's, um, it's a fairly steep slope and it's it's undeveloped. So there aren't any houses that have, uh, you know, access to them on that side of the street. So maybe you, maybe you would just want to restrict it if you didn't want to, um, you know, open a new can of worms there. Was that discussed at TPC about just having, a why, why was a seasonal restriction sort of agreed upon at that stage? Right, so the idea was that it, it kind of freed up as much parking as possible because the, it, the kind of bottlenecking only became a problem in the, in the uh, summer months. So it was, I think the director was trying to be, you know, as conservative as possible in terms of restricting. So, because the only other, the other option was just to permanently restrict the parking in her mind. It wasn't to not restrict at all. So the seasonal was a way of of trying trying to make it a little bit easier on residents who don't you know who don't park in driveways um, when there wasn't such a uh, bottlenecking issue. So do residents often park on that side of the street during the rest of the year? Chris is shaking his head. I, don't know. I mean, is that if if there's not I mean, actually not in my experience? In my experience, they all park on the side of the street where the houses are, which is right side where we're not restricting parking. So that makes a lot of sense from my, my observations. Any other questions? I mean, I'd have to say that um, for myself, I'm, gonna, I, I, I'm not going to be able to move this forward with a positive recommendation for me anyway. I just don't feel comfortable with this at all. Um, not, not, I know that I know how difficult this has been and how difficult this conversation has been. And um, the only, I would forward it personally with a neutral recommendation um, and allow this to be more fully vetted with more information on the council floor. I don't wanna stop this going forward because I respect and the uh, DPW director and I trust her opinions and thoughts on these, but I, this, I think to Council Sheriff's point, we're more or less establishing a precedent. What's inspired this precedent makes me uncomfortable. The conversation in the main makes me uncomfortable and I would not be, well, obviously comfortable forwarding this with positive recommendation. Council Chair. I would agree with that. And I would say if it's not safe for there to be parking on both sides of that street uh, during the summer, then it's not safe any time of the year and it shouldn't matter in that, uh, then we really are just restricting people from coming out of town who would be parking there during the summer. So I'm not comfortable with that. 
if I can make a suggestion, I would like to actually take all of these and move them forward with a neutral recommendation, which would be my recommendation. Thereby, we would have, because one, I really, I'm really shooting in the dark here, and it's not fair. I'm not being fair to the people who've worked on this and have considered it, and I'm not being fair to uh, people that I'm supposed to make these recommendations for. It wouldn't be fair to the council if I shared an opinion that I don't, I'm not really particularly confident of. So if we could, uh, and we're, I think it's appropriate for us to move these with a neutral recommendation, but I would actually ask one of you to consider making that and take them as a group, move them forward with a neutral recommendation where we can have a more full discussion and conversation about this with um, representation from the transportation parking and maybe even um, Director Lascalia could come and help or help us with that as well. Um, what do we do with the front street? That's what I was just about to ask. Yeah. What well, Front Street, we've Withdraw? already moved that and we, we've moved it and voted on it so that we'll have to live with that. And uh, I mean, we, we can withdraw it if you want or just take the remainders. Because actually, Front Street, I think we're all agreed that that we look looking at that and even what I know about that makes sense, yeah. actually. I, that, I always presumed the there was no part. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That one is the most straightforward. Yeah. So if we take the remainder as a group and if someone would make this recommendation and I'd, I'd be grateful. <laughs> uh, I'll move uh, 21, 241, 242, and 243 as a group for a neutral recommendation. Second. Okay. Any discussion on those as a neutral recommendation on those items? Just to thank that you for that, that suggestion. Okay. All right. Laura, please call the roll on that. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Mayori. Yes. And Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Thank you. And believe it or not, that's the end of our business. Uh, yes. Laura, if you could uh, attach a note that um, in the future, uh, all, if, if transportation and parking could supply us with more information to work with, it be, would be much appreciated. And I'd give them a special kiss and a hug if it were allowed by law and not inappropriate. So, um, okay. So there's one other motion left. Move to adjourn. Second. What? All right. Council, Council Sharon moved to adjourn. Councilor Thorpe seconded. And, and uh, roll call, please. Councilor Dwight. Oh, yes. Councilor Shara. Yes. Councilor Mayori. Yes. And Councillor Thorpe. Yes.